I just want to start by confirming we have our quorum. Commissioner Cameron. Uh, present. Good morning. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien, good morning. Good morning. I'm here. Thank you, Commissioner Zuniga. Good morning. Uh, thank you. And uh, I just got a text that Karen is having some difficulties, but um, I instructed her how to sign in. Um, okay. Uh, let me just see if I... Um, Um, it, what I'll ask is, I'll ask Jamie to walk her through it. Please request, oh, I don't, I'm not in charge of recording today. Actually appreciating that. Thank you, Shara. Yes, um, I'll just see if Jamie can help Karen coordinate. Chair, this is Loretta. Good morning. Mm -hmm. I think um, she'd need the call-in information. Oh, you know what it is? It's because um, she doesn't have a computer today. So right. she... And I don't think the invite had the call-in information. So yes. I'm going to track that down and uh, forward it to Karen, okay? Sure, we'll, we'll hold for that. You, you have the number, Loretta? I don't, but okay. I would. The right. number would be 646. Yep. Seven one six four six seven four one five yep. two five two nine three. Correct. The same Great. number. Oh, okay. actually, that that's correct, right, Shara? Okay. Or okay. 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 I'll send that now. Thank you. And we'll just uh, we'll get started, but we'll hold a bit for Karen. Um, just in terms of logistics, we've established our quorum, and a reminder. Um, Obviously, today we are holding this meeting by um, <clears throat> remote collaborative technology, and we are permitted to do that because Governor Baker did issue some relief from the open meeting law during this, uh, his declaration of a uh, state of emergency during the uh, coronavirus. <clears throat> so we appreciate, again, everyone's patience today. Um, I think what we'll do is uh, I call this meeting today, uh, it's the 308th meeting of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission on Thursday, June 18th at 10 a.m. What I will do is um, we'll go to the minutes first before Karen can, uh, joins us. I do understand that today we have had a very busy week in multiple meetings. Uh, the agenda does include uh, minutes for the 11th. We're not ready to, to, uh, to rule on those today. We will look at June 4th. Commissioner Stebbins, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, the uh, June 11th meeting was pretty extensive, so Shar is doing a great job still pulling those together. But in your packet, you had the meeting minutes for the June 4th meeting, and I would move their approval subject to any changes for typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Has everyone had the chance to review? Yes. I have one very minor point, just because it could be interpreted substantively um, incorrectly on 1024, Shara. Um, the reference to uh, says culture council, like the, maybe the, the council, the attorney for the council, but it really is the cultural council, which is the last two words in that section. So if you could just repeat that, that would be great. Okay, we'll do it. Thank you. Anything else? I was just going to second. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Further comments, edits? All right. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes, 5 0. Thank you so much. Karen, are you able to join us yet? Yes. Now, can you hear me all right? Oh, and I can see you. Yeah, here we go. Thank there. you. Phew. Okay. You appear to be in a different spot. I am. My uh, uh, computer's getting redone, so I'm down in the kitchen on my home computer. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you. Uh, we are now just moving on to item number three on the agenda, your administrative update. Thank you. Okay, so I actually am going to turn this over to Alex Lightbaum for that uh, first item regarding the, uh, uh, up the legislative update. I see Alex. Good morning, there. Alex. Good morning. Uh, as everyone's probably aware, the um, racing statutes expire um, 
July 1st, they were renewed until July 1st. So um, the, uh, I think in the past we've sent a uh, letter uh, just to gently remind everybody that um, it's expiring. <clears throat> uh, obviously the um, legislature has been very busy um, under these uh, circumstances with the COVID and all. Um, our various um, stakeholders have, um, are all aware of this um, expiration and are also um, taking steps to uh, make sure it's not uh, lost in the shuffle. Okay, great. It's June 30th, correct? Yes. Thank you. And on the, uh, uh, the simulcast update, I know we have guests today. Yes, um, the commission has plans from Suffolk and from Raynham um, for reopening their simulcast facilities. Um, both of these venues have plenty of space for social distancing. And um, Chip Tuttle is here for Suffolk if the commissioners wanna uh, ask any questions on that plan. And then we can go on to Raynham. Good morning, Mr. Tuttle. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, nice to see everybody. Yeah. Nice to see you. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Mr. Tuttle. Um, I, you know, I, I see that you pretty much, obviously, you're following state guidelines here with your plan. Are there any unique challenges, maybe due to the age of your facility, or any other challenges that you may want to talk to us about with your opening? Um, thank you, Commissioner Cameron. Uh, I, I don't really think there are any unique challenges. Um, you know, most of the challenges involved around social distancing and, and uh, money handling, um, those sorts of protocols. We are fortunate that the venue, uh, the, the capacity for the venue is 38,000 people. So uh, <laughs> there has, that, that crowd hasn't been there since Seabiscuit, but... Um, so it does give us a lot of flexibility on social distancing protocols, uh, though we are proposing in our plan to you to limit uh, operations to the first floor of the clubhouse at the outset and to limit attendance to uh, no more than 250 people uh, in an indoor and outdoor space that can hold, uh, you know, probably in, in the low thousands of people. So um, we're, we're, following all of the state guidelines and and we're also in contact with the city of boston about uh, boston department of health guidelines um and some of those specifically as we talk about reopening our restaurant facility uh as we move forward and you mentioned signage as a way of really informing people will you have others there staff members who will be reminding folks to follow the guidelines or um, just making sure that they're being followed in some manner? Y yes, so we've, we've already started reconfiguring the first floor um, and we are going to have people enter uh, where they have to come through turnstiles. We, we have turnstiles still from when we charged for admission. Um, we haven't charged for admission in several years, but we kept the turnstiles for special events. Um, so people will, will come through the turnstiles where they will be greeted <clears throat> by some of our union employees uh, who will remind them of the social distancing protocols. We'll have hand sanitizer and masks available at uh, those entrance areas uh, for people who forget to wear a mask who would, who would like one. Um, and we also, uh, because of the reduced uh, operational capacity with only opening the first floor, we are, are taking some of uh, the paramutual clerks, those employees, and, and uh, sort of having them work in a customer service, social distancing uh, reminder capacity on the floor. So in addition to our security team, uh, which will be the same as if we were open on all three floors, uh, we'll have some other folks uh, walking around just reminding people to observe the protocols. Great, thank you. Mr. Tuttle, um, on your uh, document, you do say uh, encourage the wearing of a mask and encourage social distancing. I'm not sure how my fellow commissioners, if they saw that as well, Commissioner O'Brien or Stebbins or Zuniga. Yeah. Yeah, In no, order, I to, do you, uh, I think, I wonder if the word require should be 
substituted in order to comply fully with the um, expectations of the governor's office. I was going to ask the same question. Chair. Oh, okay, Commissioner Bryan, I should have asked. It would be great for us to be consistent across all our licensed properties. Uh, we're, we're, required, we're, right? happy to, uh, we're happy to make that require uh, only, only noting that, that I believe we have, um, we're not able to require mask wearing of people who have a medical issue or some sort of issue that prevents them from, from wearing a mask safely. I, I'm, I'm happy to, to double back with our council and, yeah. and others on that, but we certainly want to comply and be consistent with whatever guidelines you're setting for other facilities. I, I think it's actually, um, that's set by the state right now, by the governor's office, and I believe um, Mayor Walsh too, but no, okay. so. Um, masks are required, and particularly you're in. You're still considered inside, so that would be. And Correct. but I think you can have your attorney do just a, a footnote or an asterisk. Uh, of course, there would be proper exceptions for medical uh, yeah. conditions. Okay. Uh, uh, Commissioner Zuniga, Commissioner O'Brien, I'm having a little trouble. Uh, I can't see if anyone's leaning in. Yes. Yeah, Commissioner uh, O'Brien, do you have a question? No, it, you asked it actually. That was oh. the question that I had. Okay. It seemed like encourage, according to the current rules, it should be required. In uh, both cases. So under, it's under uh, the screening, entrance screening, and then under social distancing. Yes. Right? Commissioner O'Brien? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, Commissioner uh, Stebbins, I think you were asking. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, and I had the question about the mask too. My other question is, um, Mr. Tuttle, is there adequate protection at the paramutual clerk windows for uh, folks, you know, your employees to be protected as well? I'm assuming they're wearing masks, but I don't know if they're plexiglass or anything else that you have available. Uh, yes, Commissioner, uh, we have installed uh, plexiglass uh, on the paramutual windows on the first floor of the clubhouse, uh, and we have um, we are spacing uh, the manned windows uh, every three to ensure that there's a, uh, at least six feet, actually more, uh, closer to eight in our case, of social distancing between the windows. So, so plexiglass. Um, with an opening that will allow the, the transaction of, of cash and tickets, but also will protect uh, people from any airborne, uh, further protect from, from uh, airborne, uh, I guess, issues, right? Yeah. Got it. Okay, thank you for doing that. I, I had a, a couple of questions, uh, Chair. <laughs> um, I, I, appreciate, I appreciate the notion of the 38,000 feet, but I think the document, the square feet rather, uh, uh, it's a very large operation, most of which has been unoccupied for a while. I think the metric, as you correctly point out in the document, is the 50% occupancy, uh, which is something that I think we discussed last time, uh, when we were yesterday, when we were talking about casinos. And uh, the clubhouse, first floor, the occupancy, it appears that um, the maximum occupancy is 600, or is that the 50% uh, that is the 600? Um, so the, the, it, it's an interpretation actually of the way that um, the city of Boston inspection services have, has set out our occupancy for each area. Um, the occupancy for the hall, they, they, they refer to the entire first floor uh, clubhouse link building and grandstand of it as a hall that uh, has occupancy of 22,000 people. Um, we, we uh, but the, the restaurant on the second floor, which is the same footprint as the first floor of the clubhouse, has an occupancy of 600 the, the top cider restaurant on the top cider room on the third floor has an occupancy of, of 600. So we, we are assuming that the first floor of the clubhouse has the same occupancy of 600 uh, and thought that 50% that of that would be 300 and that to limit the crowd to 250 
uh, would keep us well under the occupancy for that area. In other words, the 50% occupancy of that area. Yes, correct. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so and that's the only area that uh, that, that where there will be the simulcasting monitors. Correct. Yeah. So, um, which I think is the relevant number. Again, I appreciate the you know the the, the expanse of your building, but um, so um, just help us understand. And it's been a while since I visited. I don't know if um, other commissioners have been to uh, the top cider room that uh, Chip is describing. Um, but there's a small monitors, is my recollection, and uh, people generally congregate around them to see the end of the race. Um, how is that going to be, you know, set up so that there is the adequate social distancing, or do you foresee any kind of challenges there? Uh, yes, so that's a, that's a good question, Commissioner Zuniga, and um, we have marked the first floor of the clubhouse uh, with specific areas for places for people to stand so they're six feet apart. Um, we have started both a, a, a system uh, of uh, queuing up for the mutual windows and in front of televisions. Uh, and since we're only opening the first floor, uh, we have we are moving televisions from other places so that there are more television screens on the first floor, uh, allowing people to be able to see whatever race signal they want to see without congregating around one or two sets. Um, and then the the uh, personnel that I mentioned before uh, will be monitoring uh, that people are actually standing where they're supposed to and not uh you know congregating in ways that are not consistent with the social distancing guidelines we are, we are also moving some screens outside as well so that people who are outside on the clubhouse apron will be able to see uh the races from outside uh in those areas uh, okay good um also i don't know if you have seen our discussions from yesterday but um we struggle quite a bit with um, beverage service and the notion of people walking around with that. Um, can you paint a picture of what that may look like uh, in the in the in your operation? Yeah. So this is this is a work in progress still, um, as you know. But but we are what we're planning is that there will only be a waiter and waitress service at tables outdoors uh, consistent with Boston DPH guidelines on outdoor service. Uh, you, you won't be able to go to a bar and, and order a beer uh, the way you, you were able to, you know, pre-COVID-19. Uh, but if you're interested in, in coffee, soft drink, uh, or an alcoholic beverage uh, and seated at a table outside, you will be able to order one from a server who, who will then bring it to you. That's that's great. And uh, and then what happens uh, if the patron decides to stand up, take their drink with them, and go to another area like the monitor because it's the one that they want to see? Yeah, and, and I think that's where we're we're going to need to be vigilant and cognizant of of requiring them to to follow the protocols. <laughs> So uh, on, on that, just, just as a reminder, we have learned to Mr. Tuttle that, that you know, the idea is to be seated while eating or drinking because that's when your mask would be lowered. And the recommendation is that the mask stay lowered during that time so you're not constantly lifting and lowering so you're not touching your face. So once the drinks are done or they are finished from staying seated, no, the idea is the mask goes back up and then you're not allowed to have drink or food. So that, that's where the um, requirement of a mask will actually be a great enforcement measure, right? Uh, Commissioner Zinnick, I didn't mean to interrupt, but that is all part yeah, of it. That is, that is one key element. Uh, the other one is, um, again, what some of the things that we were struggling with yesterday, the notion that somebody, you know, sits down because that's the only place that they are allowed to have uh, a service, but then, uh, you know, take their drink and move around because that's also part of the nature of, you know, what they are used to doing before. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, talk through that. Uh, I guess it's something that we didn't quite, we have not quite resolved when it came to the casinos, but I think it applies as well to 
the operation um, uh, at Suffolk Downs in the indoor area? I, th I think currently the, the um, state's position from the public health is that, and, and Mr. Tello, you can correct me, but if I'm wrong, is that you, they are not able to leave the seated area with a, a drink. Um, and that's your clear understanding right now. It can't be carried. Yeah, I believe you are correct, Madam Chair. I, and I'll double check, but I, I think that's true. For, for restaurant and of course, no bar service right now. Yeah. So is that what you were anticipating, Chip, that they will not be able to take their drinks with them? Yes. Okay. One follow-up question. Um, you mentioned the 300 number, Mr. Tuttle, but in actuality, your average patron, a number of patrons is far less than that. Is that correct? For simulcast only? Um, no, actually, it's uh, on weekends, uh, the crowd can be, uh, depending upon, you know, summer weekends, the crowd can be in excess of three or 400, uh, sure. sometimes five or six, you know, depending mm -hmm. upon the day. So I, I think part of, um, part of this will be monitoring, you know, and, and the, they'll mm -hmm. be counting at the turnstiles okay. um, and, and, and regular counts. Uh, and, and part of it will be to see if, if, if we do need, and I, and I think I referenced this in the plan, Commissioner Cameron, if, if we feel as we're getting through the summer that it's, uh, the demand requires us to open the second floor, then we'll come back to you with, with an amended plan to do that. I see. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, uh, if I had I, another. Oh, oh. Uh, Commissioner Stebbins, would you just mind if we could just go back to the drinking and eating? Because I do see where it probably isn't entirely clear what you just committed to in your written, unless I've missed it somewhere else, Mr. Tuttle. But it does say right now, points of entry, signage and greeters incur um, encourage or will require guests to wear masks that cover the nose and mouth while at the facility, except while eating or drinking. And perhaps we should add at a designated, you know, seated area. Um, and of course, at a certain point in time that there may be relief to that restriction, but I, I think, and I, I'm, I'm welcoming the, in, the input from my fellow commissioners on that, that might, might be helpful and then actually affirmatively say, uh, you know, they, guests may not walk around with their, with their drinks. Commissioner Zunica, what do you think? Yeah, I guess that's what I was um, trying to get at. Uh, how, we, how it's phrased um, is, is, is very important, but then, of course, how it's enforced is something that we, you know, we discussed yeah. plenty yesterday. I believe that's con consistent, too, with our next guest. Um, so that, that's another point of clarification in your written document. Uh, Commissioner Cameron or Commissioner uh, Stebbins or Commissioner um, O'Brien, if you want to chime in on just that and then we'll go to Commissioner Stebbins' question. Yeah, I, I can just, I, I do want to chime in on that. Um, Chip, just to remind, or Mr. Tuttle, just to remind us, um, is uh, beverage service at Suffolk, um, is it free or are patrons paying for their drink? Uh, it, pa patrons are paying for their drinks. Okay, I, I could see that causing some issues. Somebody saying, hey, I paid for my drink, why can't I bring it with me? Um, so, you know, the, the communication with, with patrons as they arrive or even before they arrive, to the extent you have the ability to do that, um, um, I, could, I, I could see that causing a little friction, but uh, if people know, don't leave your, your drink that you paid for, or, you know, leave it where you were sitting until you finish it. Um, that's, uh, that's a little bit different than how our gaming licensees operate. Understood. Anything yeah. further on that point, and then we'll go. Commissioner Stebbins, did you want to speak um, on another point, or maybe elaborate on the communications plan? Um, obvious, you know, and thank you, Madam Chair, um, Mr. Tuttle. We've obviously stressed with our licensee, our casino licensees, to do as much communication ahead of when patrons arrive, so they have an idea of what to expect. Being that you're required to wear a mask, and we'll have some available to you, or obviously this protocol or provision around 
uh, beverage service. Uh, additionally, I had a question of, uh, we know that racing is uh, back open in other jurisdictions. Does the availability of races to watch and bet on, is that impacting in any way your hours of operation or um, is there enough product out there that you see a good steady flow of, uh, of patrons throughout the day? Um, y yes, uh, Commissioner. In, in March and April, there was not a ton of product. Um, you know, a handful of states, Florida, Arkansas, um, California in, in some uh, areas because it was more of a countywide uh, decision in in several parts of California. Uh, now we're, we're you know we're back to almost a full uh, menu of simulcast options. Uh, you know, Florida, West Virginia, Kentucky, California, New York, uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, operating uh, with no spectators but operating. Um, safely with COVID-19 protocols due to uh, the unique nature of horse racing and, and the fact that there is not uh, any physical contact uh, between the participants. Okay, it's good to hear. Thank you for that update. In, in fact, the Belmont Stakes is this weekend, isn't it? Uh, it correct, Commissioner Zuniga. It is uh, Saturday uh, down in New York. And um, when... When uh, when are, were you planning to? Um, are you working towards um, a phase three reopening? Um, is that? Yeah, we we um, we're working towards phase three, and um, you know, and, and while that may be early July, in order to to give everybody a chance to to catch up, um, we're looking at uh, July eighth, ninth, tenth, that time frame. Uh, we do want to have um, the ability to have the employees in for training uh, before we, we open up and, and get everybody comfortable with the protocols um, and, and the communications issues that you've raised will be a big part of that. Uh, Madam Chair, sorry to interrupt, but as I mentioned at agenda setting, I need to leave the meeting until 1230. So I am just going to exit and I will um, rejoin at 1230. Thank you and good luck to your graduating fifth grader. Thank you. <laughs> we applaud her. Excellent, I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you, good luck and, and, yeah. um, and we wish her well. See you at 1230, all right, bye. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any additional questions for Mr. Tuttle? Um, we are gonna be hearing uh, from uh, Mr. Corey and perhaps Mr. Carney on uh, Rainham. Uh, if, if Mr. Tuttle, you wish to stay on. I don't believe that uh, uh, Mr. Grossman, we are expected to act on th these guidelines. Uh, I, I was gonna make that question. I, I wasn't, I assume that we, when we, when I got the packet that we didn't, I think there's enough time to, you know, uh, look at this, but uh, but that was going to be my question as well. Right. Mr. Grossman? I, I think that's that's right. I think it, this is a good opportunity to look at them uh, and ensure that you have a satisfactory comfort level, um, allow Mr. Tuttle to make any uh, updates or tweaks that he uh, would like to make in response to this conversation. Uh, and then we can have another look at it maybe before um, the intended opening. If okay, I'm, I'm going to pause for one minute. Our dear colleague, I can see Mary Thurlow, is struggling, and I suspect she's looking for her shared drive right now. Is that possible, Mary? Can you can you unmute? I can't unmute her, Shar. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out. For some reason, my my computer is running on battery and not plugged in. So just uh, okay, I'll, good. All right. We just want. I was going to. I was going to ask for technical assistance for you if you needed it. It was almost like I was being a, a citizen, just observing a crisis at hand. So yes, I appreciate it. We're trying to figure out why it's not charging. So if yeah. I go blank, I, I'll get my home computer up and. Well, we're good. We're good. You've got time and and good luck. And I can see you're in good hands. Thank you. All right. Um, okay. Then that sounds good, Mr. Grossman. We have time. 
we've given a couple of suggestions in terms of probably bringing um, uh, these uh, guidelines further in sync with the current status of the advice that we understand is um, being made available from the, the state level from the uh, Governor Baker's administration. Okay, barring no further questions at this time, we'll move on then to uh, Mr. Corey and, and Mr. Carney. Good morning. If Mr. Carney's here, I only see you, Mr. Corey. Thank so, you. Um, Madam Chair. Um, oh, sorry. Good morning. We have uh, Sue Rodriguez from um, Raynham, representing Raynham. She's on the line, oh, along I, with George Carney, representing I'm Raynham. sorry, I just didn't see her name. I knew that she was planning on, on joining. Thank you. Yes. Good, good morning, Sue. I don't. We might have to um, unmute her at star six. Shara. I'm looking for her phone number. Um, um, yeah. 508-824-4071. Yes, can you hear me? There we go, yes, yes. thank you. Good, Good morning. morning. Good morning, Sue, how are you? I'm very fine, thank you. We have Mr. Carney and our Rain and Park team as well. Excellent, thank you. So um, do you want to um, walk us through your, your guidelines? As Alex, is that how you'd like to proceed? Yes. Okay, excellent. So we are very unique, our facility, and we do not face a lot of the challenges that the other facilities may because we have such a large venue and our attendance pre-pandemic is less than what we would have to reconfigure. So we have taken out numerous tables and chairs. We will be using our club two and three area, which is on the second floor. And the occupancy there is 660. So on a regular weekday, we would not see 660. We wish we would, but we haven't seen that in, in some time. So a regular weekday, we might have approximately 150 people. A Saturday would be our busier day. And on a busy Saturday, we may be looking at about 200 people. So we're lucky that we have the occupancy limits that won't constrain us from our regular vis visitors. Um, we have put up the plexiglass in front of the paramutual lines. We are installing glass in front of our concession stand. So all of our employees will be protected. Everyone, including the guests, guests and employees will be required to wear masks. And we have installed markers and arrows throughout the property, reminding or guiding our guests and employees of the social distancing. Questions for Sue, uh, Commissioner Zuniga? Well, similar. Um, to what I was asking of um, Mr. Tuttle earlier, and I know, um, you know, I haven't been to Raynham in a little while, but um, you described the concession stand where people can come in and, you know, get a get a snack or get a beverage and then walk around. Um, how is that uh, generally? Can you just describe that setup and how is that? Um, sure. Uh, so we are planning. The bars will be closed. We will offer food and beverage by waitress service only. We do allow patrons to walk up to the food stand. Again, if you could visualize the number of patrons at a time, there is rarely any queuing to be needed, but we have put stanchions and markings throughout just to coincide with all of the regulations. So, on a regular day, you might have a patron or two that decides to come up to the stand to get their food themselves. But for the most part, our customers enjoy the waitress service. And that's what we'll be providing. And of course, we'll have staff throughout helping our patrons acclimate to the new procedures. But we, rare, we rarely, other than Kentucky Derby Day, have a day where it, there's a crowd. 
you know, it's a little bit the notion of um, people walking around with a beverage because that's sort of kind of how the layout lends itself to, is especially if you were being served that, um, you know, you have the, the ability to walk around. Um, that's again, one, one of the points that we, we discussed at length yesterday. Right, and quite frankly, we don't have patrons that walk around with their food, eating it and, and beverages. And one of the main reasons is they have a program in one hand and their tickets in the other. So that's not something that they ordinarily do. Ordinarily they're eating and consuming their beverages at a table. So I don't foresee that as any type of an issue at all. Thank, thank you for that. Uh, and the other question again, same as uh, what I was asking Mr. Tuttle, um, my recollection of the configuration is that, you know, when it comes time for the race that people were expecting, there's congregation around monitors. Some of them are small. I, I remember some of them are like designed to be for just the, the small table. How is that, um, how do you foresee that operating? So once again, I, I'm happy to report that I don't foresee that as a problem. We don't regularly have a congregation around televisions because we have such a large number of larger televisions. The smaller televisions are placed at tables where we've arranged there to be two seats at those tables for people that travel together. But because of the number of televisions that we have, it, it's not been a problem at all. And the way the seating is configured with the televisions, you can be seated and see all of the televisions right from your chair. And our population does happen to be an older population, so they do tend to be less transient. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. Com Commissioner Cameron, do you have questions? Yes, just um, you mentioned you will have staff available to, um, I, I think you said to remind people um, of the new protocols. And are they um, in a position to enforce those protocols as well? Meaning just, you know, make sure that people are listening and, uh, and complying with, with the guidelines. Yes, and, and a, a nice thing about our clientele is we have people who are here every day. They sit in the same seats yeah. and they tend to sit by themselves. So we've lucked out in this aspect. So we, there, a lot of our customers are like family here. So the, the patrons and the employees have a good relationship. In addition, we are going to have a random police officer here especially as we transition into these new regulations, just in case there is any type of resistance. Great, thank you for that. And it sounds like as you started your comments that there are no challenges that, uh, that uh, would create any, any kind of a problem. You've kind of thought this plan through and you don't feel like there's anything that would be problematic in implementing. We really don't. We feel very confident in the, the guidelines and how we can implement them. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Commissioner Stebbins. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, first of all, I think both, both our simulcast operators did a very nice job pulling these plans together. Um, and, you know, as I was reading through the Raynham plan, uh, you know, they covered every every aspect from you know the program table right. to uh how that gets cleaned so i appreciate the thoroughness of, of, of both uh both operators um so a quick question is uh do you intend to do any communication or email or note or um a, a letter for patrons either before they arrive on property or when they arrive on property to make sure that they're aware of uh, of the guidelines and, and how to conduct themselves? So yes, we have our website where we will, once everything is approved, we'll, we'll make our patrons aware of these new protocols. And we have a Facebook page, our website, and we will also put something on our telephone system 
uh, again, with our clientele, not you know, some of them are not too tech savvy, so a lot will come either through telephone and also when they arrive on site, we'll be sure that we have plenty of staff before they enter the property to let them know the requirements. Okay, great, and thank you. And of course, signage that's required, we, we have all of that ready to go. Okay, but thank you. I myself feel that the, the verbal communication is what's going to work best. Okay, thank you for that, I appreciate it. Is Mr. Carney on? Yes. Good morning, Mr. Carney. We want to thank you for presenting these guidelines. Your attorney did a very nice job. Mr. Corey, thank you. Um, I to have be honest, no... the school that did the job. <laughs> I, I did have a question for uh, Mr. Carney. Um, how are you doing, sir? How, how are you doing? For 92, I'm hanging on by a thread. <laughs> If I could add to that, if we all could be doing as well as Mr. Carney, we'd be all very lucky. <laughs> Mr. Carney, when we last spoke, you in March, you were 92. When is when do you, when does 93 July, happen? To you? July 14th. Well, we'll be thinking of you on that day. Um, let's uh, let's hope that you're able to have safe operations at that time. Uh, we we appreciate the good work, and I think that the overall census is consensus is that we do not pass on these formally today. We'll take another look. Alex will be look with Commissioner Cameron's guidance and we can, um, uh, as required, act on this uh, probably at our next um, board meeting um, or as, as uh, Commissioner Cameron has heard me re say repeatedly, we are nimble. We will not be the ones to slow it down. So. Um, as required, we'll, we will um, return to this. Loretta, did you want to co comment at all? I see you coming in. Uh, no, just staying ahead of the agenda. I'm all set. Thank okay, you. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So, thank you, Mr. Carney um, and Sue and uh, Mr. Corey and the entire team down there and Mr. Tuttle. If we have no other questions other than to wish everyone, oh, Mr. Corey. I thank you. Apologize, Madam Chair. I work with the and represent the horsemen at Plain Ridge Park Racetrack. Oh, but I saw your your name on the bottom of the the um, the guidelines. No, no, that's no. Funny. they're online. That was I think it was a separate letter that yeah, came in uh, related to the reopening oh. of. PPC. I know that you were. I thought well maybe you were also representing Mr. Carney and people and folks. So Mr. Carney, my apologies. It's the way it printed. No I thought you were a very busy gentleman from yesterday and uh, from Tuesday <laughs> and today. So Mr. Carney, my apologies. Um, but uh, the guidelines are very well done, very thorough. Mr. Tuttle's the same. I think we just had a couple suggested edits, but we will take a closer look. And then we'll move on to um, uh, the next item on our agenda. But um, I just want to thank you, and I want to make sure that uh, everyone stays well. But a special, special thought to the gentleman who turns 93 in July. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, um, Alex. Do we have anything else on our um, agenda then? Alex, you muted. Uh, I think she needs to be unmuted. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Uh, yeah, that um, concludes that part of the agenda. Okay, thank you. So Karen, I am wondering, as I look at our, um, as I look at our agenda and I think about Commissioner O'Brien's schedule, we have three next three matters are expecting votes. I know we would hope to have her be able to participate in those. Yep. Um, we obviously have a quorum and continue on four A, B, and C. That um, we also could begin our discussion on the community mitigation fund. It is now eleven thirty-two, and she would be coming back at twelve thirty. I'm sorry that our technical difficulties through our our um, agenda planning. 
So Karen, what would you suggest? Yeah, I mean, I don't think these three items would take an entire hour. So either way, I think Commissioner O'Brien is going to miss some of the community mitigation fund discussion. Uh, there's a vote on that as well. So it's a matter of, uh, you know, I think these agenda items uh, for the Investigation and Enforcement Bureau, uh, having four commissioners vote on that, they're, they're quite non-controversial. So that I think that would be okay. So I'm actually thinking going ahead with the agenda and that way Commissioner O'Brien will miss the loss of the Community Mitigation Fund discussion and have a more wholesome understanding of that. Okay, thank you. That makes sense? Okay. All right. Um, so going ahead with uh, agenda item four, uh, with the Plain Ridge Park Casino license renewal, uh, subsection A. Uh, initially, I'd really like to thank uh, Loretta Lilios, Joe Delaney, and Bill Curtis and their teams for all the work uh, gathering that information. This is uh, the agenda item regarding the uh, vote on the completeness of the application and that renewal. Uh, as a housekeeping matter, we did receive a letter from the Harness Horsemen's Association regarding PPC's relicensing. However, fortunately, it appears that most, if not all, of the issues in the letter were resolved at the public <coughs> meeting on Tuesday, given that the racetrack is expected to open at the beginning of phase three. Uh, but in any event, the agenda item today is for a vote on the completeness of the application, not a determination on actual relicensing. So this uh, would not be the forum for the discussion on those uh, issues anyway. Staff is aware of the points, um, so there doesn't need to appear to be any need for action on that today. Uh, so uh, my suggestion is we just turn it over to Loretta for the uh, review on the suitability portion of the completeness of the application and then uh, Joe and Bill on the, uh, on the rest of the application and the completeness of that. My understanding is they got some additional materials this week uh, and they can update you on that and you should be ready for a vote. Shall I proceed? Yes, please, thank uh, you. Sure, so good morning. As, as a reminder, the five-year term of PPC's license ends on June 24th. So at the outset, I want to remind you of the language of section 13 of chapter 30A, the Commonwealth Administrative Procedures Act. And the relevant provision states that if a licensee has in accordance with any law and with agency regulations made timely and sufficient application for a renewal, his license shall not expire until his application has been finally determined by the agency. So the matter for your vote today would be whether the application for renewal has been uh, timely and sufficient. With respect to the status of the suitability applications, we worked with the licensing division to identify the individuals and executives who would need to submit to the qualification process of the renewal license. And we completed that process in January of this year as a result of that scoping process, we identified 11 executives who needed to submit full applications comprised of the multi-jurisdictional forms and the Mass Massachusetts supplements, complete with financial histories. We also identified an additional five individuals, independent directors at GLPI, who needed to submit a modified application which you previously approved. And we identified a number of entities, including PPC, Penn National Gaming, and some pass-through entities that needed to submit detailed applications. All of those applications were submitted to the licensing division in a timely manner, and the licensing division verified that they were complete. In addition, the investigative team requested supplemental information from the qualifiers and conducted interviews and all of the requested information has been provided. The investigators have worked efficiently in this period of telework and have already provided me with their draft reports in all areas of suitability. I've reviewed them and in the few instances where additional information was requested, the qualifiers provided it promptly. We've shared the financial report information on the entities with Commissioner Zuniga and are in the process of making sure that any areas that he has identified can also be addressed in the report. 
and the licensee is continuing to cooperate fully in that process. In fact, there was a call with Monica Chang, Commissioner Zuniga, and uh, Justin Sebastiano from Penn National this week. So I can report with respect to suitability that the licensee has made timely and sufficient application, which is the matter that's before you for a vote today. Um, I can also report, as I've indicated, that we are very close to being able to make the suitability report and presentation to you. As I've indicated, all the reports with the exception of the financial report are complete. The financial report is near completion and you had asked for a summary memorandum, which I intend to prepare. So I have two requests for you today. The first is that you deem the suitability portion of the application to be timely and sufficient. I'd suggest that you roll that into your overall vote after you hear from Joe on the other aspects of the application. My second request is that at next week's agenda setting meeting, we set a date uh, for the suitability portion of the renewal. So if you have any requests on suitability, I, you know, I invite them now or after Joe's uh, presentation. Yeah, I can uh, uh, only um, put in a finer point to the portion of the financial report that Loretta talked about. Um, we, we had what I believe is the last uh, phone call necessary with Mr. Sebastiano of uh, Penn National Corporate, uh, just the beginning of this week. And it's really only a matter of reflecting it in the report which had been drafted um, you know, previously, and, and in my opinion, in really good shape. So I would actually characterize that report as virtually complete. It's just, it just needs to go to print, if you will. Great. Any other questions for Loretta at this, at this time? Otherwise, we'll move to Joe. Good morning, Joe. Good morning. Um, so, you know, we've been giving you updates on a fairly uh, frequent basis in the last few meetings um, on status. But uh, just as a little bit of background, um, you know, we received sort of three large batches of information from uh, PPC. We, see, we received one of them on April 15th, another one on June 1st, and the last one um, just this week on June 15th. So we compared all of that documentation to the application requirements in the letter that we sent to, um, to PPC back in February. And um, the, uh, you know, essentially uh, we compared those and it appears that the application is complete. Um, so we would certainly deem the application uh, timely and sufficient. Uh, so we're recommending that the commission accept this application as timely and sufficient and then internally we'll work uh, together to uh, pull together a schedule for all the deliberations and so on. I think it was our intention to discuss, um, to discuss this at the next uh, agenda planning session so we can figure out when it makes the most sense to come in front of the commission. We know we wanna do a public hearing. We, want it, we know we wanna do a site visit. Um, we also want this to not conflict uh, too much with the reopening of the facility. So. I think you know next week, uh, early next week, we'll probably try to get the team together and have a meeting and see how long it's going to take for everybody to get their work done. And uh, we'll put put together a, a reasonable schedule uh, for the deliberations. And with that, uh, if you have any questions, I'd be uh, happy to answer them. On those logistics, I do think, as Loretta pointed out, that would be really helpful if we could have a good solid timeline for those different touch points, uh, Joe, to discuss on, on Wednesday at our agenda setting meeting, if, if possible. With the understanding that it's a little bit difficult to assess in total with the reopening. Um, we'll, we'll try to pull something together for that meeting. Right, and then, we'll, then we can have a sense as to how it fits into our overall planning. And, and I think next Wednesday is the right, the right time to do that discussion. Substantive questions for uh, Joe or Loretta in terms of, you know, it is our, our assessment of what is in fact sufficient and timely. And so we've heard recommendations from both Loretta and Joe that we deem that the application is such. Are there any concerns or questions regarding meeting that threshold standard? 
I have no questions. I think they each gave a thorough report and um, really gave us all the key elements to feel, for me, to feel um, satisfied that this is something we should uh, move forward with. Thank you. Commissioner Zuniga? Yeah, uh, along the same lines, uh, thank you for uh, everybody who does the work, but especially in this case to the people at Penn National who are operating under a number um, of uh, staff reduction that they've had, um, although it has increased in other areas uh, recently and are able to comply with all of um, uh, and respond to our requests as well as keeping other things uh, um, you know, at play, like the reopening of the casino. So um, thank you to everybody. Commissioner Stebbins? Yeah, I, I would simply echo the good work um, and the Commissioner Zuniga's point. Um, PPC is a little shorthanded, so their ability to get some of the remaining documents that we needed um, in in a timely fashion, I greatly appreciate it. Yes, and I, and I wish to extend the same thank you and, and to, of course, the, our team, because I know it, that it, you, it's your relationship that you've established with um, our licensee and you know, their understanding that you will work reasonably and collaboratively with them in, in good faith during these trying times. And I think everybody's achieved the goal that we had hoped for. You know, in advance of the June 24th deadline, I have no reason to think we can't act on this today. From my perspective, uh, you have raised no concerns. <clears throat> so I just want to, again, echo on both sides for the licensee, for, uh, PPC, Penn National, we thank you. Uh, we look forward to the next uh, part of the work that has to be done. But at this stage, um, I believe we sounds as though we can act on this today. Do I have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I'd move that the Commission find that Plainville Gaming and Redevelopment has made timely and sufficient application for renewal of its Category 2 gaming license consistent with procedures established in the February 28, 2020 letter. According pursuant, accordingly, pursuant to Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 13, the gaming license shall not expire until a final determination as to whether to renew the license has been made by the commission. Second. Further questions, discussion? Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes, 4-0, noting that uh, Commissioner um, O'Brien simply could not be here during this vote. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, I, and I, I would I'd like to apologize. I realize it's very difficult to see me. I look like I'm in witness protection over here. I just I have no lights in front of me and I can't figure out how to solve that. Um, so the, the next item on the agenda is uh, an MGM qualifier with a vote for suitability. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kate Hartigan, our Senior Enforcement Counsel at the IEB. Good morning. Good morning, Kate. Okay. It's nice to see you all. Um, and yes, uh, as Executive Director Well said, um, there are actually two corporate qualifiers for your consideration. Um, the MGM uh, qualifier is Mr. Mahmoud Sliman, um, and in addition, I'll be presenting Mr. Marcus Trummer. Um, I'd note uh, he's a, qual a qualifier for Encore Boston Harbor. Uh, both Mr. Sliman and Mr. Trummer submitted all of the required forms and complied with all of the IEB's requests for supplemental and updated information. With regard to both investigations, the IEB conducted its complete protocol for suitability for casino qualifiers and confirmed financial stability and integrity, reviewed litigation history, searched criminal history, verified that no prohibited political contributions were made in Massachusetts, and conducted checks of open source and law enforcement databases with regard to both qualifiers. The team for Mr. Sliman's investigation was Trooper John Morris of the Massachusetts State Police Gaming Enforcement Unit and financial investigator Fei Zhao. Uh, the team for Mr. Trummer was Trooper David Collette of the Massachusetts State Police Gaming Enforcement Unit and financial investigator David McKay. And I would note that IEB investigators were able to interview both of the qualifiers via video conference, uh, given our current situation. Mr. Sliman was interviewed on April 8th of 2020, Mr. Trummer on April 16th of 2020. Uh, both parties were 
noted to be cooperative and forthcoming in all aspects of the investigation. And at this time, I'll turn to the specifics of Mr. Sliman's investigation. Mr. Sliman joined MGM Resorts International in February of 2019 as the Executive Director of Development Operations, responsible for managing team and automation processes for software releases. He reports directly to MGM's Vice President of Quality Assurance, Release Management and Project Management, Mr. Samir Al-Rashid. Mr. Sliman is based out of Las Vegas. Prior to his employment with MGM, uh, he began his uh, career in the gaming industry with Aristocrat Technologies, where he held several positions in Australia. Beginning in 1998 through 2008, he was a senior software engineer with Aristocrat Technologies. Um, from 2008 to 2009, he was a program manager with Aristocrat. And from 2009 to 2010, he was their CBL planning manager. Uh, then moving from Australia to Las Vegas, but still employed by Aristocrat in November of 2010 through February of 2012, Mr. Sliman became the Director of Quality Assurance and Product Compliance for Aristocrat. He then transitioned to employment with MGM uh, beginning in September of 2012, uh, working as a program manager until July of 2013, uh, and then became the Director of Business Technology Partners in July of 2013 and held that position through March of 2015. Beginning in March of 2015, he became the Director of Quality Assurance until September of 2016 when he took over his current role as the Executive Director of Quality Assurance, uh, serving as uh, through February of uh, 2019. Uh, and his title now is, uh, beginning in February of 2019 to the present, Executive Director of Development Operations, uh, Managing Team and Automation Processes, as I mentioned for software releases. Uh, it's noted that Mr. Sliman holds gaming licenses in three jurisdictions, Nevada, Michigan, and Mississippi, and investigators were able to confirm that all of these licenses are in standing. Uh, background review confirmed that Mr. Sliman uh, completed his undergraduate studies at the Universidad Nueva Esparta in Venezuela in 1995, where he received the equivalent of a Bachelor of Science degree in computer information systems. Mr. Sliman has demonstrated to the IEB by clear and convincing evidence that he is suitable, and the IEB recommends the commission vote to find him suitable as a qualifier for MGM Springfield. And I would pause at this point before turning to Mr. Tremor if the commissioners would like to vote now. Do you yeah, have any I, questions? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, um, yes, Madam Chair. You no, know, just that it was a very clean investigation to read, no issues at all, and I see no reason why we should move forward with, uh, with finding Mr. Saleem suitable. Any questions then um, for Commissioner Stebbins or Suniga? No questions. Good report. So with that, Madam Chair, I move that the commission find uh, Mahoud Saleem, uh, Executive Director of Development Operations for MGM Resorts International suitable as a qualifier for Blue Top Redevelopment LLC. Second. Thank you. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. I vote yes. Thank you. And I will pass the compliments on to uh, onto the investigative team who are joining me on this call. They did an excellent job. So thank you. Um, Moving on to the next qualifier, Kate. Yes, Thank you. Uh, sh certainly, uh, the next qualifier for your consideration is Mr. Marcus Trummer. He's the Senior Vice President and Chief Audit Executive for Wynn Resorts Limited, which is the parent company of Encore Boston Harbor. Uh, Mr. Trummer attended the University of California at Santa Barbara, graduating in 1994 with a bachelor's degree in business economics. At Wynn Resorts Limited, his main responsibilities as Senior Vice President and Chief Audit Executive are development, implementation, and monitoring of the company's internal controls, with an emphasis on compliance with outside regulatory agencies, such as the Securities and Exchange Commission and state regulators like the MGC. Mr. Tremor is based in Las Vegas and reports directly to the Wynn Resorts Audit Committee. He does so at their quarterly meetings. Prior to joining Wynn in 2003, Mr. Trummer worked at Caesars World Incorporated, where he was the corporate internal auditor. Uh, he began there as an intern uh, and moved into a full-time position where he served from July 1994 through November of 1995. 
He then moved to Arthur Anderson LLP, a large accounting firm, from August of 1999 through uh, May of 2002. Uh, he then moved to Deloitte & Touche, where he uh, was an experienced risk services manager. That was the same role he had held at Arthur Anderson. Uh, he was at Deloitte & Touche from May of 2002 through July of 2003. It was in 2003 uh, that Mr. Tremor joined Wynn Resorts Limited. Um, he joined uh, first uh, as um, a department of one, uh, as uh, their uh, auditing chief. Uh, and since then, the company growth has um, required him to take on more control. He now supervises 30 auditors on an international basis um, for the company. Um, so uh, due to that, Mr. Trummer, although he's essentially held um, the same position since 2003, because the role has evolved um, and because of the investigation um, into, no, 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 no. into Mr. Wynn, um, the, the rescope has captured um, Mr. Trummer at this point, although he's essentially held this position since 2003. So just to clarify uh, that timeline, if it did seem attenuated um, to any of the commissioners, that's why he has been captured and um, been subject to qualification at this point. Uh, Mr. Trummer is currently licensed in good standing only in uh, one jurisdiction, and that is in Nevada. Um, he's licensed there through the Game and Control Board, and his license is noted to be in good standing. Uh, Mr. Trummer has demonstrated to the IEB by clear and convincing evidence that he is suitable, and the IEB recommends the commission vote to find him suitable as a qualifier for Encore Boston Harbor. Any questions from the commissioners? I have one question, and and I it might need to be best directed to um, uh, Councillor Lilios. Uh, can you help me, Loretta? Is this the same position? Because I know Commissioner O'Brien is not on. Is this the position that was raised uh, in the independent monitor's report um, where there was an outstanding qualification issue, or is that a different position on compliance? That's a different position. Uh, um, so we are uh, working on an outstanding matter on, on that. There were three qualifiers designated uh, around the time of the, uh, the hearing last spring. Um, right after the hearing, while you were in, in deliberations, three additional qualifiers were designated. Uh, Mr. Trummer is the second of the three, and um, Mr. Whalen is the third of the three, and his is still outstanding. Thank you for that clarification. This is a, a critically important role, so excellent report. Thank you, Kate. Commissioner Cameron Zuniga or Stebbins, do you have questions? Commissioner Zuniga, oh, you're all set, okay. No questions, thank you. Commissioner Stebbins, you're all set as well? All set, thank you, Madam Chair. I, um, thank you, as an important clarifier for me and an excellent report. Again, thanking everyone on your entire team. Loretta and Kate for their thoroughness, including the um, officers who help on the interviews. Thank you. We have a motion. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd move that the commission find Marcus Alexander Trummer, Senior v Vice President and Chief Audit Executive for Wind Resorts Limited, suitable as a qualifier for Wind Mass LLC. Second. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien, I mean, Commissioner Cameron. My Aye. Opinion. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Stebbins? Aye. Vote yes, 4 0. Again, noting uh, Commissioner O'Brien's um, absence. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, Kate, uh, excellent presentation as well. So, uh, <clears throat> moving on then on our agenda, um, we have uh, the Community Mitigation Fund. Extensive work has been done by this team. Uh, we applaud the thoroughness. We all enjoyed um, very helpful uh, our two by two briefings. We've had the opportunity to review extensive materials, but this part of our meeting is incredibly important given the amount of money that is at stake. So we um, welcome the first part of the community mitigation report, starting with uh, Joe and Mary. And uh, questions, I think, should be asked along the way, perhaps, Joe? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, yeah, my intention is to go through each of the applications and at the end of each application, open it for questions on that particular 
um, application. Um, so just uh, to start, I'd like to take five minutes up front here and, and go over at kind of a high level, you know, how we arrived at our recommendations. Um, there were a number of factors that came into play um, that resulted in an award recommendation that was below the target that was in our guidelines. Now, the implementation of the Community Mitigation Fund for 2020 has uh, proven to be particularly challenging. You know, with the advent of COVID-19 right in the middle of our review process, we've had to react and develop systems to work around you know, these issues of working remotely while holding extensive meetings with applicants, licensees, and other agencies, all while keeping to our established schedule. Because of this, we've also had to rethink some of the assumptions that were made when the guidelines were developed, and we've had to modify or postpone some of the applications in response uh, to the effects of COVID-19. Um, looking ahead just a little bit, uh, you know, the closure of the casinos and an expected ramp up of operations once the casinos reopen has tempered our expectations on revenues um, for the Community Mitigation Fund for 2021. Uh, I've done some early, you know, really rough estimates of, uh, reven of the revenues, and they range from a low of about 4.7 million to a high of 7.3 million which compares to the $11.5 million that were generated uh, for the Community Mitigation Fund in uh, 2019. So as such, we've tried to be conservative in our expenditures for 2020 uh, with an eye towards 2021. Uh, no applications that we received were identified that uh, needed any kind of an expedited review or were considered to be uh, particularly urgent. Um, this year's also been a little challenging from a grant award standpoint. Um, the program is fiscally constrained in several ways. Uh, under the guidelines, target spending was identified for several categories, and spending was also constrained by region. So for instance, in Region A, the guidelines establish a maximum spending of $6 million, while there were applications for over $9 million. Similarly, under the uh, transportation construction grant category, we had a target of $3 million with applications totaling $5.7 million. <clears throat> so we did have to make some difficult choices with respect to which grants were recommended for funding and some worthy projects had to go unfunded or be funded at a reduced rate. Now, one of the major tenets of this program is that these grants must be in response to a direct impact of the casino. Before the casinos opened, the connection to the casino was typically based on studies that had been done as part of the MEPA process or other studies conducted by the licensees or by the Gaming Commission itself. Now that the casinos have opened, we've been asking for documentation of the actual impact of the casino on the app on the community. Now some jurisdictions have done a good job with this, but there were instances this year where we did not recommend funding due at least in part to a lack of supporting documentation of the impacts. Now and there were also a few projects where applicants were requesting additional money to continue work being done under previous grants. Now, some of these applicants requested money where expenditures from the previous grants may not have even started. Now, considering the expected shortfall in funding next year, uh, we were reluctant to recommend tying up these additional funds that may not be used for some, uh, for some period of time, some perhaps substantial period of time. And again, just before we get into the details of the fund, I wanted to uh, once again, thank the review team for all their help. And the review team consisted of uh, Commissioner Stebbins, uh, Commissioner Zuniga, uh, Jill Griffin, Carrie Teresi, Kate Hardigan, Crystal Howard, Teresa Fiore, and Tanya Perez, who joined our team partway through. Also Vivian Scholl, who helped uh, with some administrative tasks, and especially to Mary Thurlow, who has spent countless hours pulling this all together. Um, and again, everybody really stepped up to the plate on this and were integral in getting this done on time. 
Now getting into the details of the fund itself, uh, just a little background. Uh, the, the applications were due to the Gaming Commission on February 1st of 2020. We received 37 applications uh, totaling over $13 million. Um, now both the number of requests and the dollar value are significantly higher than we have ever received before. In fact, I think the applications were up more than 50% from the previous year. Um, and as we mentioned before, under the guidelines, $11.5 million was available for grants with 6 million targeted for Region A, 5 million targeted for Region B, and 500,000 targeted for the Category 2 on tribal facilities. Uh, these applications were also sent to our licensees and to MassDOT for comment. And in the write-up, you'll see that these comments uh, from the various uh, groups were incorporated into our write-up for each one of the grants. So the review team is recommending uh, awarding grants totaling just under $6.7 million, with $3.9 million going to Region A, 2.5 million to Region B, and 283,000 to the tribal and category two facility. So Mary's sharing um, some pertinent sections of the memo uh, with the group so you can see, uh, see what, uh, what we're looking at. Um, and this chart here that's on page four is a, a good summary of the targeted spending and the recommended awards. Um, so now, these numbers are significantly lower than the 11.5 million target that was established in the guidelines. But due to the reasons we just talked about a moment ago, the review team is very comfortable with our recommendations. Um, now, before we go on, um, do the commissioners have any questions on, on sort of the, the broad parameters of what we're doing? Commissioner Stebbin and Commissioner Zuniga, you're quite involved in supporting this. Is there anything that you want to comment on in particular? Yeah, the only thing that I would add, and that was a very good summary, Joe, mm -hmm. and I'll speak very more good. to the, some of the details as we go along, but um, the one thing that I would add is, uh, you mentioned all the reasons for being conservative, and I think they're all appropriate. There was also, I would say, um, a, a recognition and a lot of discussion that a lot of these projects will be very important uh, to the communities um, as a, in, in, in the environment that we're in, um, that uh, uh, some of the funding recommendations will go a long way to make a big difference, uh, even if they're uh, reduced in the original um, request. Uh, and that is a theme that I think makes it through a lot of the recommendations. Uh, so we're trying. I, I, I would argue where there's there's a balance that uh, is being um, uh, at least uh, um, uh, desired here. I think achieved in the notion of uh, trying to be conservative on one side from the original target that was set under very different circumstances, but recognizing that there's monies available and they will make a big difference in um, in some of these projects in these communities. Commissioner Stabbins? Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, a good update and a good overview from Joe. And, and also want to thank the, uh, our team that worked so hard on all of these recommendations. And also thank the, uh, the applicant community officials who, with everything else going on, made time to connect with us all virtually, go through those question and answer sessions, as well as do a lot of the follow up uh, replies to additional questions that came up. Um, I think it's just, not to, to sound like a Debbie Downer, but I, I wanna pick up on Joe's concern about what we head into next year, um, having again, lost a few months of revenue, not sure what revenue will return when our, when our uh, class one licensees are able to reopen. Um, so I appreciate first of all, the conservative approach we had this year, uh, but something for the commission and as Joe and Mary begin this ramp up process to next year, thinking along the lines of uh, unused reserve amounts that have not been tapped into by communities 
as well as awards we've made in previous years that have not been tapped yet. Um, giving some consideration of whether the you know the commission should claw back that money, uh, not quite knowing what uh, 2021 is going to is is going to show us or uh, uh, face us with. So, um, but great work all around. Um, you know, great job by Joe and Mary in keeping the process going and the whole team. And uh, I think the recommendations, as we'll go through them, you'll see are, uh, uh, are pretty strong. And as Commissioner Zuniga hinted, uh, are backed up by, you know, data and showing direct impacts. Excellent. Commissioner Cameron, do you have any questions at this stage? Uh, I do not, thanks. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you for that thorough overview, Joe. Do you want to continue now? Yes, thank you. Um, so just for our discussions today, we're going to jump around a little bit in the memo. Uh, we're going to try to cover specific categories of grants. So today we're hoping to cover the workforce grants, the non-transportation planning grants, and if time allows, the transportation planning grants. And for next week, next Thursday, we'll cover the remainder of the transportation planning grants, if there are any. Um, and also the specific impact grants and the transportation construction project grants. So, um, so Mary's skipping up here to page 35 of the memo to the workforce grants. And um, before we get into the details of the, the two particular grants, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some of the COVID-19 impacts on this area. Um, in our discussions with our licensees early on in this process, we asked them you know, what the effect of COVID-19 would be on their workforce once the casinos were allowed to reopen. And their general indication was that they don't see right now a significant need for newly trained uh, dealers or hotel or culinary positions since they'll initially be operating at a reduced capacity and also will likely be hiring their currently laid off or furloughed workers. You know, in fact, given what we're seeing in the news these days, I've seen several articles recently uh, with respect to hotel and restaurant workers, there uh, certainly could be a surplus of qualified workers available in these areas uh, due to layoffs and other things at, uh, at other uh, locations around the city. So for these reasons, we are recommending that certain industry specific portions of these grants not be funded, particularly the culinary and hospitality related programs. Now, we are recommending uh, grants to maintain the basic education programs, as you know, all the casino employees are required to have a high school diploma or a GED or high set. Um, and while maybe not the day the casinos reopen, but over the course of the next year, there will be some turnover as there always has been and keeping a pipeline of, of, of people, you know, moving forward to fill those positions we think is, a, is worthwhile. And I have uh, with me Jill Griffin today um, and she's going to go over the two workforce grants in a little bit more detail. So I will turn it over to Jill. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Jill. Thank you. Um, so um, Holyoke Community College submitted an application and they initially requested $450,000 to continue uh, the training programs they had established um, through the Community Mitigation Fund um, over the past couple of years. Um, and these were focused on addressing the lack of workforce readiness skills of Hamden County residents. Their proposal is made up of four parts. One, um, Springfield's um, uh, Ahead of the Game Basic Skills Program that focuses on um, adult basic education and high school equivalency um, program. Number two, um, Springfield Technical Community College's Hamden Prep 
adult ba basic education, digital literacy, and career readiness training. Um, the third component uh, was the Mass Casino Careers Training Institute's um, gaming skills training. Um, and this was a collaboration between um, Springfield Technical Community College and Holyoke Community College. The fourth component was um, Holyoke Community College's culinary and hospitality skills training. So as Joe mentioned, the review team is not recommending awarding the gaming school or the um, culinary and hospitality portions of the grant um, funds. The review team is recommending awarding $199,000 for the Hamden Prep and the Springfield Public Schools portion of the grant. Um, so with that um, general description, I'm going to open it up for questions. Commissioners, uh, Commissioner Cameron? Cameron? This is, this is uh, Gail Cameron. Um, they have been offering, uh, the, the, com the combination of these two schools have been offering this training for the last couple of years, correct? Correct. And it is working successfully. The team took a look at that and, and it is effective toward uh, getting folks the skills they need to then be employed at uh, MGM. Um, yes, we have um, seen results. Um, there were changes that they um, recommended in this year's application, such as um, um, marketing, uh, funds for marketing of programs to um, encourage, uh, I guess, a larger pool of applicants. Okay. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure the team, um, and I know that the team always does look, look at past results uh, when awarding new um, uh, recommending that we approve new grants. So thanks for that. Other questions for Jill on this? Jill, I just wanted to ask, is, have, have you heard of whether or not there's been disruptions given the uh, rem need to be entirely remote in terms of learning right now? Um, so the um, these um, applicants did um, propose digital learning uh, shifts um, to encourage um, remote learning. So we are comfortable with um, this proposal in terms of um, being able to offer those remote learning situations. Yep. <clears throat> That's excellent because I know there've been challenges. So that's good, uh, you know, for everybody, including for us today. So that's excellent. I have no particular questions except that I'm pleased to see that they'll be continuing. We'll be able to continue to support um, uh, components of the. Um, if I'm understanding correctly, the adult basic education, in, in at this time. Um, if, if anything, this allows people the opportunity to, to study where we're in this remote situation to concentrate on completing uh, this part of their education. So I, I'm, I am very pleased that we can continue in some way, even though I understand it's a conservative way on education and workforce development. Thanks, Jill. It, I know it's, it's, a tough, it's tough to swallow this for you um, at this time. But uh, again, the dollars will hopefully be able to be applied next year when it's um, in a more targeted way uh, and compliant with our, our requirements. And I just yeah. wanted to add one quick thing in is that um, your agenda does indicate that there would be votes on this, but um, we had agreed that we we're gonna wait and do all of the votes at next Thursday's meeting rather than uh, doing them no, individually. Uh, thanks, thanks, uh, Joe. Because I think we all decided that it really makes sense for us to have the whole picture in front of us before we vote in part. Uh, <clears throat> so thank you for for commenting on that. That we will reserve uh, the ability to vote next week, and then of course Commissioner O'Brien will be able to participate fully. Uh, 
uh, with that, I'll turn it back to Jill for the uh, the next one. Uh, uh, Joe, let me just uh, comment on the Apologies, whole thing. Commissioner. No, no worries. Um, on the, on the both of the workforce grants, interestingly enough, um, you know, it's uh, what was unique, I think, in this process of reviewing these two workforce applications is that these applications came in by February 1st. And we went back to both applicants and said, if you had a chance to do this application now, would you make any changes? Um, and, and there was some good back and forth between us and the applicants. Um, I would suggest, I mean, listen, a, a lot of us are trying to figure out what the, what the employment landscape is going to look like. Uh, you look at unemployment claims, a lot of those are coming from the culinary and hospitality um, industry, as, as Jill referenced in her comments, and that you know, we're not sure what that's going to do to the availability of people when our licensees reopen. Um, you know, additionally, um, you know, focusing on still doing some of the basic ed programs uh, helps give residents a runway to be able to complete that education and then look at, you know, some specific job skill training after that. Uh, but it kind of keeps them on that path to uh, keep going through a lot of the adult basic ed requirements that so many uh, careers require now. Um, what I would suggest, and again, I know we're not voting on this today, I would suggest that Jill and her team and Joe and Mary continue to work with our workforce applicants as the, maybe the employment landscape becomes a little clearer uh, in the weeks and months ahead and certainly invite them if they had to come back and repurpose or uh, defer that part of their proposal, come back to us and say, there's an emergency need to do this type of training, not only to, res you know, as this program was set up, is not only to respond to the needs of our licensees, but the needs of the business community who might have lost employers, employees, I'm sorry, uh, to our licensees and just give them that that flexibility that we could revisit uh, an application um, in the future as the, as the kind of employment landscape becomes a little bit clearer. I think we have that authority and I, I would um, think that this is probably uh, one of those places where we should give it serious consideration. That's a really helpful observation, Commissioner Stebbins, as we struggle on this particular uh, category. That's very helpful. And if, if our processes permit and there's no statutory prohibition, uh, I, I think that's a really helpful suggestion. Joe? Yeah, that's, 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 um, that really is, I think. And we, I think we do have the ability to do that, um, should it become necessary. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank that's you. We're working with our, with our folks. Um, Okay, I, I think that we, I think we would note that that's with respect to this particular area, the workforce. Um, yes. In light of, in light of where we are with respect to COVID nineteen, that's really your point, correct, Commissioner Stevens? Yes, it is. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to clarify two things. Um, thank you, Commissioner Stevens, for your remarks. Um, the you know what, I, I'm sorry, I can't tell who's speaking right now uh, because oh. it, uh, the, the memo covers everybody's faces. So I don't have the ability to see faces right now. So if you could identify. Sure. I, I, this is Jill Griffin, sorry. Thank you, Jill. I couldn't tell if it almost sounded like you were Loretta. So I'm so sorry. Thank you. Um, I wanted to clarify um, two things before we finish with this grant proposal. Um, we mentioned that the $199,000 was to support Hamden Prep and the Springfield Public Schools. Uh, but additionally, uh, we did recommend um, $37,000 for regional collaboration. Um, and this was to fund a coordinator to uh, focus on recruitment, cross referrals, and to track outcomes. Um, and um, as you'll remember, the guidelines allowed us to award up to $50,000. Um, so 
Um, and we will likely be coming to you with a request, um, an applicant request to um, approve rollover funding from FY19 um, to be used um, this fiscal year. Thank, thank you, Jill. That's helpful too. Uh, and I do apologize. Uh, perhaps because we are using the, we'll be using the um, the memo throughout the presentation. If we are, we should identify ourselves to the extent that's helpful. Because I, I um, I couldn't see Jill's face. I had to scroll down. So thank you. There you are. The live version. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Jill, do you, are you continuing on to the next one or? Yes, um, if you're ready, I'll continue on to Mass Hire Metro North. Thank you. Um, so Mass Hire Metro North um, and the city of Boston have collaborated with Mass Hire being the lead applicant. Um, this application requested $450,000 to address hospitality sector needs. Um, the project consists of five parts. One, outreach and community engagement to local residents. Number two, career advising. Um, number three, adult basic education, job training, job readiness. Um, also, for job placement and five job training. Um, and the job training they propose um, is the New England Center for Arts and Technology, also called NECAT, which is a um, culinary arts training program. Um, best hospitality training um, was focused on um, house housekeeping pre-apprentice and English for hospitality. So again, the review team is not recommending awarding the NECAT in the best portions of the grant. Um, the review team is recommending awarding $172,000 for the community engagement, career advising, and employment services portion of the grant. And with that, I will open it up for questions. Oh, and before I do, I will just say that um, there also in this um, portion of the grant, um, we awarded about $40,000 for regional need. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. I, I don't have a specific question. I think you are certainly, the team has been consistent in looking at both regions in a similar manner and, you know, awarding the portions that make sense under the, the um, present circumstances. So that, that looks like it's appropriate to me. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Zuniga, Commissioner Stebbins. Well, I will just uh, emphasize, I guess, the point that, um, that Gail made and uh, has been made before, that um, I think this strikes a balance in recognizing that um, you know, there may be a supply surplus for at least some time, um, but funding the longer lead items, as uh, it was described before, the pipeline, we preserve the overall programs, uh, which is what is what is um, uh, why the recommendation comes the way it is. So I'm in full support of this approach. I thought I would just note that the, uh, of course, the licensee Encore Boston Harbor has um, acknowledged that they uh, had a very positive experience collaborating collaborating with Mass Hire. So we look forward to the continued partnership. And again, as uh, Commissioner Zunica said, it is a, we're investing in some long-term long opportunity for individuals down the road as, um, as our economy begins to stabilize. Commissioner Stebbins? Um, no, nothing to add. It was, um, you know, just a comment on both programs uh, is, 
Jill alluded to, both programs, uh, both applicants uh, have had a good working relationship with our licensees and their track record has been successful. Um, so uh, this is in no way any reflection on the great work that they've done in the past uh, grant award cycles. Yeah, I should acknowledge, I appreciate the difficult decision making that's gone on here. So thank you, uh, very, very thoughtful, although I understand difficult. Moving on, Joe. Okay, so we are done with one category. Thank you very much, Jill. Uh, uh, we, Jill, we appreciate uh, you and, and Crystal, your team's work. Thank you so much. I can't see you right now because of the, <laughs> thank, the configuration. Thank so thank you. And I love seeing your live face. Uh, you have a great photograph and the live is special. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just am noting it's 12, about to be 12. 30. Commissioner O'Brien should be coming back momentarily, and so it might make sense. Um, no, I'm, I'm back just, on, Kathy. Oh, oh you on. are. Very, very My, that one. I didn't jump in because I didn't hear enough to comment. Oh, good. Well, um, first off, congratu congratulations to the conclusion of the fifth graders yeah. <laughs> year. Um, Commissioner Zuniga, would you welcome a break? Can he hear me? Yeah, I, I think the I, I, I can, and I guess you couldn't see me, but um, yes. I think it might make sense to take a short break, uh, you know, for sustenance and um, uh, in between categories makes some sense. That does think. make some sense. And my apologies, it's going to be a little bit hard for me and, and perhaps in, in Joe um, and Mary to navigate sometimes because it's important for us to see the memo, but we are only seeing a, a limited number of faces so speak up there's no no one is being rude if i can't see your photo and i can't detect differences in voices so thank you um, um I think, kathy yes. if you think that, that that the memo being up is a distraction we can certainly take it down i just thought it might be beneficial for some of the people who are looking in who can see a little bit more detail than what we're describing i'm comfortable with keeping it up unless uh my fellow commissioners would you know feel differently Keep it up. Yes, yes, I hear Commissioner Cameron. Yes, I think it's important. Okay. And we can, it just means that we should speak up. I can't see hand signals or leaning in. And so I, I don't want to in any way be um, hampering the progress of our discussion. We should be okay. Um, but I'm welcome back, Commissioner O'Brien. I think we'll take a break. It's 1230. Uh, Commissioner Zinnika, does 20 minutes work given our late start? Or would you like more? Uh, fine, whatever works for people. I, um, Can we re, um, reconvene at, at uh, 12.50 then? 10 of sure. 1, please? Does that work or is that too short, folks? Fine. Thanks. I'm hearing no major complaint. I appreciate everyone's patience and we'll break for 20 minutes. Thank you. Reconvene Thank you. at 12.50. Again, I can't see, but Commissioner Cameron, are you? Let me see if I can scroll down. And I'm right here. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Commissioner O'Brien. There we are. Okay. Um, uh, Karen, you're back on. And Joe and Mary. And we have had Jill's report. So it looks like we are in a position for me to reconvene meeting, um, public meeting number 308 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. We'll continue now with the um, uh, community, community mitigation report from from Joe and Mary, thank you so much. Great, thank you. Um, so we're moving on now to the non-transportation planning grants. Um, <laughs> and the first one uh, for your consideration is an application by Everett for a study of their designated port area. So um, they're requesting $100,000 to perform a study on the designated port area in Everett which is adjacent to the Encore Casino and the additional land owned by Encore. Um, the port area is about a 300 acre tract of industrial land generally located to the east of Encore on, Mis on the Mystic River. Think uh, the Exelon power plant across the street plus the, um, you know, the scrap metal yard, the, uh, the Schnitzer scrap metal yard beyond that and so there's a bunch of other uses back there, of, you know, pretty heavy industrial nature. So 
The development of Encore and the subsequent purchases of land across the street by Encore has really changed the whole character of Lower Broadway. Um, as the area further develops, it's expected that there'll be some additional market pressures uh, put to bear on that designated port area. <clears throat> so because of this impact on the port area, Everett is proposing to conduct a study of that area to determine if it's really functioning at its highest and best use and to determine if any changes should be made uh, to the port area. Um, so the review team agrees that it's uh, certainly appropriate to perform a proactive study like this before there's a real firm proposal for those other lower Broadway properties. And we recommend that the uh, $100,000 be awarded to the city of Everett for that study. And so with that brief de uh, description, I'll open it up for questions. Commissioners, Commissioner uh, Zuniga. I would, I would add that um, there's a key feature here, and that's uh, a little bit of a theme from before, but it carries over to other grants as well, and that is this long lead um, nature. Um, I think uh, um, Joe alluded to it well, but um, you know, the notion that it's important to, to, to invest in, in these kinds of uh, studies so that then subsequent uses and economic development really can can happen. So I'm, uh, um, I'm very much in favor of this grant. Commissioners Stebbins, Cameron, or um, O'Brien? I'm hearing none. And again, forgive me, I can't see everyone at one time. Commissioner O'Brien, you're all set? Okay. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you. Again, just, to, uh, it's in your memo, it's, it's quite clear in the red um, the bolded red, but again, Encore Boston Harbor uh, supports the city of Everett study here. And we thank them for their continued collaboration. Makes good sense to me, uh, Joe. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, no other questions. We'll move on to the next one. Um, this is the uh, city of Medford. They're looking to hire a consultant uh, to establish a business technical assistance program in the community. Um, so, you know, Medford gets uh, an allocation of funds from their surrounding community agreement to help businesses kind of spruce up their operations and so on. But they, the SCA also requires that uh, Encore uh, try to spend a certain amount of money in the community um, in fact, their target's $10 million a year. Um, and what has happened, uh, well, to date, those, those purchases from the city businesses uh, have not been reaching their established targets. Um, you know, we only have data up through uh, the end of December, which was six months of operation, roughly. But, um, but those numbers were lagging uh, somewhat. And in addition to that, the city itself has gone through an administration change and has had some additional staff turnover, which has created some difficulties for them in implementing this business assistance program and monitoring Encore's compliance with their SCA. So this grant uh, will establish criteria for the distribution of those surrounding community agreement funds with local businesses. To, and it will also uh, develop a system to ensure compliance with the surrounding community agreement, um, which should ultimately help local businesses secure additional business with Encore. So the review team agreed that this grant uh, will help city businesses in obtaining the SCA funds and also improve the ability of these businesses to establish relationships uh, with Encore. So we're recommending a one-time grant here of $100,000 to the city of Memphis. Questions for uh, Joe on the Medford program. I would um, I would only emphasize the one time uh, no, uh, notion here. Um, there's monies, as Joe mentioned, that come to the uh, to Medford from the surrounding community agreement. 
um, and this would go a long way to helping them figure out how and where those are being um, spent and, and, and used in the, in the best way possible. Um, but I, as one commissioner, would not want to necessarily see an ongoing funding of these type of um, requests. And it's something that we can either make very clear now and uh, also reflect in guidelines at a later time. I think it's it's um, the one-time nature really achieves a balance. Commissioner Stebbins or Commissioner O'Brien or Commissioner Cameron. Uh, yeah, I would I would just echo that. And obviously, um, Encore Boston Harbor and a number of their surrounding community agreements, as Joe referenced, had commitment to find local you know local vendors as well as uh, procure a number of. Um, thousands of dollars in gift certificates. So hopefully this grant will kind of drive that communication between Encore Boston Harbor and, uh, and this uh, business assistance person uh, on behalf of the city of Medford. By the way, I should mention, um, there was quite a bit of discussion and this is a good example uh, of just the timing of some of these requests, given the uncertainty of um, an ongoing closure, let's say. So um, I guess it's, there's, a, there's an anticipation that there will be an eventual uh, reopening, however that looks like, uh, and that there's still plenty of time for some of these monies to make it through to the communities and they can start planning in advance. Um, but it's another one of the many, uh, features of what we wrestled with in terms of uh, making funding decisions in an environment where, well, for one, the, the casino is not operating. I'd, I'd like to add, I understand, uh, Commissioner Zuniga, that you're suggesting it's one time. Uh, I, I'm appreciating why you are making that recommendation. I am wondering, if Joe, if you could explain what the follow-up is to the feedback that we get on a grant like this uh, to learn how it leverages uh, the, um, these services will help actually uh, assist the relationship and in, in the coordination with Encore and to uh, achieve its goals. So I'm just wondering what the follow-up is because Perhaps this is one time for this um, particular city, but if it's particularly effective, I'd like to know that so it could maybe be replicated. Sure, you know, the, the, the city of Medford, their, their longer term plan is to hire an economic development director. And that person would be responsible for implementing this plan. So, you know, with respect to, you know, part of this is is going to be, um, you know, looking at the grant money that they, or the money that they get from their surrounding community agreement and how best to spend that. And the other piece of it though is is, is building up these relationships and, and maybe the capacity of some of these companies to participate in contracts with Encore. You know, there may be, right. you know, saying, you know, some training for these firms to, you know, uh, working with a company like Encore is not the same as working for a, a much smaller company. They have a whole set of protocols that you have to follow. Mm -hmm. The idea is to try to build up the capacity of these uh, businesses to allow them to, to, to pursue opportunities with, with Encore. And I think having that economic development director is very important. But also this document will establish a framework that frankly anyone could use. You know, part of this problem with turnover and other things is, you know, you have a, someone has an idea of how to do something and if it isn't well documented, uh, it disappears and then <laughs> comes in and says, oh, we have to start this whole thing all over again. Part of this, pro part of this whole thing is to say, let's document this whole system here and what we're trying to accomplish. And then we have a framework to go forward that whether it's a new mayor, a new, employee, new whatever, um, that they know sort of what the expectations are. 
Right, and if it's effective, it could be a roadmap for another municipality that's facing the same challenges. So I sure. think part of our job will be to, to see the, uh, the follow-up and to make sure we get the feedback. I know that this is part of your overall goal, but I think it could be just the right amount of sort of seed money to, to actually be something that could be replicated for others, so. Yeah, and you know, the follow-up on this, I mean, we will see a more, a much more detailed scope of work when they go out to hire this consultant, uh, you know, and, and we'll have input on that and we will make sure that that this is, you know, ticking all the right boxes on 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 what we're trying to accomplish. Thank you. Commissioner Cameron or Brian or Stebbins. Makes makes good sense for me. I follow the logic with the team and, and um, makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Great. Commissioner O'Brien? No, I, I think um, I would just echo what was said by um, Commissioner Zubiga and Stebbins. Okay, Commissioner Stebbins. I'm all set, thanks Madam Chair. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks Joe, if you wanna go on to Northampton. Okay, Northampton. Um, this is uh, known as Northampton Live. It's their marketing program for 2020. Uh, Northampton's asking for $100,000 to continue operating the Northampton Live website which was originally developed with community mitigation fund, uh, community mitigation funds. And we also did provide a little bit of additional funding last year to continue with the marketing effort. <clears throat> now the, the purpose of this website is to mitigate negative impacts on Northampton from the development of the MGM uh, Springfield Casino. And, and the way they do that is by, they're really continuing to focus on marketing to their sort of usual clientele as well as expanding to target new customers drawn to the area by MGM. <clears throat> and some numbers that they have submitted to us regarding um, taxes, meal and hotel taxes, indicate that this seems to, to be uh, working, that, that Northampton is sort of holding their own with respect to keeping uh, business in town. Now, obviously that's all before COVID-19, but you know, the. These non-transportation planning grants were established to provide planning funds for projects that, are, that weren't funded sort of in other categories. And we generally expect that it's the responsibility of the community to implement the plan. Now, with respect to this Northampton application, much of the proposed funding appears to be for normal operational costs associated with just running the platform on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, some of the spending is definitely for additional content development and, and things of that nature, but much of the costs are for reporting and advertising. And you know, so the review team was not convinced that many of these costs are for true planning activities. You know, and frankly, this is a hard one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the website was developed using MGC funds and we felt that that was appropriate and we certainly don't wanna see this whole thing wither on the vine. But also this category of funding was not designed to be a vehicle for ongoing operational support. Um, so I guess, you know, in a sense, we're looking at this as a transitional year where we provide enough funds to keep the platform moving forward, but but really with the understanding that Northampton cannot rely on MGC funding, you know, to keep this thing going indefinitely. They have to work and get their local businesses and community and others to support this. And, you know, and they're making steps towards that, but they're, they're not there yet. And of course, with COVID-19 and, you know, the impact that that's had on small businesses, you know, asking uh, small businesses to, you know, put up monetary support for this, at this point in time is probably a little bit of a difficult ask. <clears throat> but so what we are recommending is that uh, we award $50,000 for this to Northampton for this project with the understanding that these funds can only be used for the further development of the platform and not for routine operational costs. Um, and in addition, we expect that Northampton will need to make this platform self-sustaining in the future, you know, without the benefit of, of CMF funds. And with that, I will uh, open it up for questions. Questions from uh, Commissioner Stebbins. 
Uh, Madam Chair, uh, more a comment. It, uh, I, I think Joe and the review team laid this out really well. Uh, if you think back, Northampton came to us with this proposal, uh, original proposal prior to MGM's opening, and you know we're very forward thinking and worrying about the impact of MGM on their community. Um, and as Joe pointed out, some of the just some of the measurements uh, that we would look at to see if there was a negative impact, and that's local motel taxes, local meals taxes, um, have really not been affected. And I think to Joe's point, may have been uh, helped along by the presence of the um, uh, of the website. So uh, I agree with the recommendation, and uh, uh, the city of Northampton should be. Uh, uh, congratulated for trying to get out ahead of any potential impacts, and I think they've done that. Other commissioners' comments? Um. Uh, yeah, this um, is very consistent with what we've done in past years, you know, meaning uh, operational costs uh, were not the intention of, of these grants. And so I think this is, again, very consistent with approaches we've taken in the past and it does make sense to me to, to tell you know let them know like the project but uh, the monies can't be used for operational costs can i just get a clarification on that because this is one that i am you know struggling with a little bit it, it may seem like oh you know it's not our our largest request but um with respect to what just commissioner cameron said it isn't an affirmative prohibition that they um, can't be used for operational um, costs. It's just, is it in the actual guidelines that they may not, or has it just been practiced? You know, it, it's not It's not specifically prohibited in the guidelines, but if you read, when you read the guidelines, it continually talks about planning efforts and, and, and so on, and it, and it sort of indicates that in any plan, it should be addressing a specific thing and that there should be a clear plan of implementation for that. Um, so, so right now, Joe. Is, yeah. So right now, Joe, the idea is that this fifty thousand would could only be used if we were to award it for a further development of the back end and not the front end. Is that the idea of the website? Yeah. You know, the, some of the things that you know, some of the lessons learned on the first year of operation of this thing. They're saying, hey, we could we could probably do a little better job here trying to target these kinds of businesses and this and that, you know, and, and it's sort of really development of the platform and not just a, uh, you know, some of these things are, you know, they run, the, the website runs advertisements on other people's websites. You know, when you, when you are, are searching on maybe Expedia or something and you type in Northampton, an ad will pop up for their website. So, so I'll tell you, I'll be more specific as to what I'm concerned about is that, you know, given COVID-19, local businesses are struggling with respect to being able to, as we've repeatedly said, communicate their plans for safety and how Northampton itself is communicating its plan for its safety while continuing to support the, um, the local businesses and the small businesses. And of course, I, I'd love to see a, a collaboration with the casinos in Northampton to sort of leverage this grant to further communicate um, their cross-marketing efforts in a way that's reflective of our, our, our current um, situation. And so I'm assuming that all of these, these tweaks and these communications plans are taxing um, the budgets of our loca localities. And I just am thinking it, it may, my, my concerns just may deviate too much from our, from our um, criteria, but I, this is, I'm struggling a little bit where we're saying um, at this particular time that 50,000 can be used, but it may be on the back end and maybe it's actually, would be much more helpful to be on the front end. And if that's considered operational, I guess I understand. That, that's, uh, it's, it's Enrique, um, Chair. I, um, I have a, uh, a, a slightly different and perhaps more on the fundamental side uh, of our concern. I think the recommendation is okay, um, but um, 
and, and, and it's embedded in the licensee comment here, which is um, there's originally Northampton was quite concerned that um, MGM was going to take away uh, customers from their downtown, from their um, entertainment destination. And that really narrative never really um, came about. Now, now came COVID-19 and you know, who knows what's gonna happen. Um, but um, the efforts, the, 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 the notion turned, what's really in the guidelines is the connection to the casino. Uh, and what's, that's really in the mitigation, uh, uh, you know, in the statute when it comes to the mitigation. And that to me is um, where I struggle uh, a little bit on, on, this, on this one. I do on the other hand recognize that we funded in the past uh, an effort that it would be really a pity to let just, as, as Joe said, to just die on the vine. Um, and that in these most of unusual circumstances, it makes sense to continue at least, uh, you know, funding whatever might keep um, uh, things uh, alive. And I guess, um, that's, perhaps I think, perhaps that's, it's the website that's keeping it alive, you know, the cross marketing, you know, the, that's the thing is that as Commissioner Stebbin said, they had early vision to be proactive to say, let's not just let all everything go to the casino. And that's one of my concerns now is there's a lot of focus on the casinos, possibly reopening during COVID-19. Small businesses in every locality is really struggling. So I wonder if it's still consistent with that fundamental statutory requirement of mitigation on impact. That's really where I'm, I'm struggling, like right at, right at where the, the localities are having such difficulties, so. Um, well, there are difficulties that they're closed, um, you know, and, and I think- No, they're you know, not all closed. Now the small business retails are starting. Um, well, it has been. The, the most yeah. recent until, you know, until if they're operating with a couple of chairs on the sidewalk as opposed to indoors and or they're part of phase three or phase four, um, but, but that's, that's again, my point, Commissioner Zinnick, and I don't want to belabor it, but and I just, if I'm, if I'm way off, I, I, I want to make sure that uh, we're just all thinking about the fact that if, if there's, if this other extra 50,000 in any way fits into the paradigm that we're facing right now, given COVID-19, without deviating and just, I'm throwing it out, you know, just to remind well, yeah. That, yeah. That's the impact. The impact has been COVID-19 on everybody. Now, does it affect different well, entities in different ways? Uh, it sounds like it does. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's not the impact of people going to the casino instead of Northampton. It's the impact of COVID-19 that we well, know. Well, no, but we don't know that. We don't, you know, that's my, the, without, without um, really good cross-marketing and cross you know, continued coordination, will Northampton get forgotten because of, of this year? That's all. Um, and that's why I asked if it was, could, if, could they use any of the 50,000 for the front end or is it strictly for the back end? Yeah, Again, just, I guess, you know, just the, the guidelines just simply aren't that specific. You know, I mean, our reading on it has been that, that these, I mean, the category itself is planning. So if we say that this is supposed to be for planning. Um, yeah, I understand. But, but, I, but I imagine that, and I guess I would have to ask uh, maybe Todd or someone to opine on on what the commission's ability might be uh, legally to you know to extend that to to other types of uses. So I don't really know. I don't want to belabor. I, um, can other commissioners, if you have any thoughts on what I was um, addressing, I welcome it. Otherwise, we can move on. Okay, then let's go on to um, Revere and the hospitality advocate. Okay, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, Revere is requesting $100,000 uh, to fund a hospitality advocate in their Department of Strategic Planning and Economic Development. Um, they're looking for these funds uh, to pay for that person for 18 months. Um, and they're looking to have this person organize the city's hotels, restaurants, and entertainment venues into a Revere 
Travel and Tourism Council. Um, apparently, Revere had a Travel and Tourism Council some time ago that uh, went away during the, uh, the Great Recession back in 2008 or thereabouts, and they're looking to uh, kind of resurrect that. Now, the application and the follow-up information that we requested identified some potential opportunities for cross-marketing with Encore and to capitalize on Encore-related hospitality opportunities. Um, but the main focus of the application seemed to be the reestablishment of this uh, tourism council. Um, you know, the review team just didn't believe that Revere articulated sort of a clear impact of Encore that this proposal seeks to address. Um, and in addition, the review team also questioned you know, whether the use of this grant was appropriate considering that the area is already served by you know, two different um, uh, uh, visitor bureaus. We have the, the Greater Boston and the North of Boston uh, Convention and Visitors Bureaus. So for those reasons, the review team uh, doesn't recommend awarding a grant uh, to the city of Revere for this hospitality end. That will open it up for questions on that one. Commissioners, Commissioner um, Cameron? Or yeah, uh, yes, Joe, I know that when we talked about um, uh, some of these applications in the uh, two by two, um, I said, well, they are, they've had two bites at the apple to, um, to really convince the, um, the working group that this, there is a connection. And, um, and I think you explained to me that actually they had three bites at the apple. Will you, is this, this is one of those applications that you gave them a chance to explain further what, um, what the connection would be and that they didn't, they didn't do that to the satisfaction of the, um, of the committee? Yeah, that's essentially it. You know, we ask them, they, they, they need to provide that in their application. And then we have a conversation with them where we, in this case, no, we don't ask every applicant, uh, but in this case, we asked for some additional information regarding that. And then we su submit them those questions in writing. So we sort of got a, you know, in the application, then a verbal response and then a written response. And, you know, when we added it all up, there was, you know, there was some anecdotal evidence of some connections, but there was really no indication that there was either a positive or a negative impact, particularly from the casino that, that really needed to be addressed. Now, with that said, if they established this Travel and Tourism Council, they could certainly try to attract um, people to stay in Revere hotels because it's probably less expensive than staying at Encore or uh, you know other attractions of Revere, Revere Beach, and other things. Um, but we just didn't see that that they really established an impact that this application would really address. Commissioner O'Brien? Oh, I'm all set, thanks. Okay, Commissioner Stebbins, Commissioner Zuniga? Yeah, um, Madam Chair, this is Bruce. Uh, just to pick up on a, a couple of Joe's comments, um, you know, and again, I wanna go back for a minute, reflect on the fact that you know, non-transportation planning grants are also designed to allow a community to try to maximize the presence of the of the casino the presence of the casino itself and i think that's i think an attempt here by revere to do that even though as joe said uh, you know drawing those lines and those connections uh weren't as strong in the application as we would have liked to have seen them um kind of going back to our discussion around northampton and and, and there's a couple other applications coming up um you know Joe talked about the fact that there are already designated tourism bureaus, tourism councils, which were designated by the state to cover the economic and tourism uh, uh, development going on in their territory and the communities within that territory. Um, I would hope at some point we might be able to get to a point where all of the hosts and surrounding communities are working with our licensees so that there are great lines of communication and also bringing in the regional tourism council so that there's more of a, a regional approach which might 
maximize the dollars and maximize the impact of future grants. But uh, I agree with the recommendation that uh, some of the lines for the impact just weren't made that clear to us. Um, but on the other side of this, got to be excited for the city of Everett and the growth, uh, I'm sorry, Revere, and, uh, and excited for the growth that they're seeing. Just to expand a little bit, you know, I want to make it clear. It's not that the review team doesn't like, didn't like this project in and of itself. It's just simply that the connection to the casino wasn't there. You know, I think any community that's trying to improve their travel and tourism, we think that's a, a laudable goal, but we just need to see that nexus to the casino. Seneca? Yeah, I, I think that's a theme on, on a lot of the instances where we where we either uh, reducing the recommendation or declining to fund the grant request in full. And um, I think I, I agree with the recommendation. It's not easy to say uh, no to, 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 um, to people that put the time and effort to think uh, critically about what they want uh, as, as advocates of their own uh, cities. But I think, as, as you mentioned, um, um, this cuts uh, um, the way it does. So I, I want to, I, I understand why we're not making this recommendation, but I, I had uh, this conversation with Joe and Mary, I'm not with Mary, well, I guess Mary, yes, you were there, and maybe Jill too. I'm wondering if, um, you know, we, where we are seeing the applications not rise to the level that permits, um, they haven't made that connection that we need. It doesn't permit us to uh, recommend an award. That perhaps, and maybe it's during our remote, uh, uh, while we're working remotely, perhaps that we um, have some kind of um, round table uh, trainings where disappointed applicants and successful applicants and our team are able to gather exchange um, ideas so that they start to imagine how this money can be leveraged for their for their benefit it was contemplated to be used by the legislature in this way and we want to do everything we can to train and to enable the communities um, to be able to successfully apply for um, these awards so um, i'm hoping that we can think about that you know, there is, you know, grant writing and is, is an art, and it may be in many ways that some of the people who are writing it think that connection is so obvious. The one thing I won't, um, you know, I heard uh, Commissioner Cameron say, well, they had three bite of the apples. I, I was lucky enough at one point in my career to run the Judicial Nominating Commission for um, a governor, and the number of times great judges, some of the best judges in our state applied and didn't get it was because their application just kept on improving and then finally they got their judgeship and then they became all-stars. Um, one very successful SJC judge said, I applied 17 times. So I don't wanna ever have it be that they weren't successful. I would always want to you know, encourage, it's okay um, to keep on trying, but I think we should affirmatively offer some supports and guidance too. Well, we we have the um, we we have the process of the local community mitigation advisory right. uh, committees. Right. Now, granted, they they're, they happen more towards the fall in anticipation of the guidelines for the new yeah. year, and this yeah. in the most of unusual years, uh, there was no yes. no real consultation. Um, um, right, you know, I understand that. Commission. Yes, and I think we should leverage them to, and, and Joe said the same thing to me, but I'm just wondering if we can think outside the box about how, you know, the using the, the HD meeting, the virtual, uh, to get feedback um, and have maybe the, the municipal, particularly the folks who actually write these applications maybe meet. And I, you know, I know that they meet with you separately, but if they meet together, it's just an idea, again, to support successful application writing. Yeah, and I think this is something that it seems to me is probably appropriate when we issue our new guidelines is to have a series of meetings, maybe a meeting in the east, another one out west, um, 
with the local communities and other agencies that are requesting funds through workforce or otherwise, and just have a have a little workshop to say yeah. this is this is what this is what we need to see for you to be successful. Yeah. I love that idea, Joe, of a workshop. And and Jill is, is so fabulous at thinking about how to pass along that information. So I just thought in addition to the, you know, we do have the local for the local committees, and that's great. But I just thought if if this could help the process, we we should try to implement it, adding it to the to-do list. Sorry, Joe. Oh, quite all right. <laughs> Okay, great. So moving on, and I think that that's just, I won't mention that again, but I do know, as you mentioned, Commissioner Zuniga um, and Commissioner Stevens, it's a little bit of a theme, and I think I, I encountered it last year right when I came on, so I know it's a challenge, but well, grant writing is a challenge and, and an art in and of itself, so thank you. Okay, um, so the next one is Saugus. Uh, they are looking to hire a casino related business development specialist. Um, they're asking for $100,000 to fund this uh, position for two years uh, to try to help uh, grow business connections uh, between Saugus businesses and Encore. Um, you're gonna, I think this really is very similar to the Revere application uh, in, in some respects. Um, so what this did, um, the main focus of this effort is to look at the businesses in an area known as Cliftondale Square. And Cliftondale Square is a, uh, is a sort of a, a shopping district in a neighborhood which has a number of restaurants and other uses there. Um, you know, the, they've done some studies in the past to identify ways to improve businesses in Saugus and Cliftondale Square in particular. And you know, these studies do mention Cliftondale Square and trying to attract Encore business, but that's not really the focus of the studies. I mean, they're really looking to, you know, uh, trying to attract more local area residents to that area and, and doesn't seem to be a real focus on Encore. Um, and so essentially, you know, the, similar to uh, the Revere application, the review team uh, felt that the application and, and follow-up information just didn't really articulate the impact of the casino or provide, you know, documentation of that impact. So, uh, therefore, the review team does not recommend the award of a grant uh, to the town of Saugus for this application. Questions, Commissioner? Commissioner Cameron or Commissioner O'Brien? No questions. Okay, Commissioner O'Brien, all set? Yes, okay. I'm all set, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I'm now I, I can shift to see faces. Um, my lighting is shifting to Commissioner Zuniga, Commissioner Stebbins. All set for me. Yeah, no questions for me. Okay, and of course, Commissioner O'Brien, uh, before you were, um, had returned, we of course are, are uh, going to shift voting after we hear about all of the applications. Uh, so for next week. All right, moving on. West Springfield, Joe? So uh, West Springfield, um, West Springfield's requesting $50,000 to create a series of videos to market West Springfield's attractions, businesses and amenities uh, to attract customers from the surrounding area, to help fill vacant storefronts and to capitalize on casino patrons that are interested in exploring the area. And again, you're going to see, you're seeing a similar theme here. Uh, you know, the application that we got asserts that, you know, West Springfield's businesses are being negatively impacted by MGM because the local businesses rely on the same pool of discretionary income that the casino and nearby attractions draw from. And the application, uh, but you know, there's no real connection to the casino on why those storefronts were empty. Um, and the thing that complicates matters here is that the first look back study 
Now that look back study is part of what they do is they look at the economic impact of the casino on the surrounding communities and their local businesses and actually tries to put a dollar value on what that impact is. So absent having that study in place, and we also don't have um, you know, some of the economic stuff that, that Sigma is doing and other things, you know, we, we just don't have any level of documentation that really demonstrates this impact on a local business. So now there also were some other concerns expressed with the application. Um, you know, the scope of work that they provided made this uh, project look more like a, a general function of the West Springfield government you know, they wanted to have uh, pieces on the schools and the city hall and the, the town hall and, you know, how to do things within the town and not really a huge focus on the economic development purposes that were sort of the stated intention of this. And then the other thing is that the town hadn't really developed a true partnership with the casino regarding sort of distribution and implementation of the project. And, but really, you know, it comes down more to the, the lack of connection to an impact where we're not recommending funding this project. Now, with that said, you know, once these look back studies are done or some of these other studies are done and we can demonstrate an impact, this might very well be an appropriate use of these funds for a future year. But it just seems that, it, you know, today we can't make that firm connection to an impact from the casino. And with that, I'll open it for questions. But I think Bruce, I'd like to ask you to opine on this a little bit. I know you had a, a lot of a lot of input while we were developing this. Sure, thanks, Joe. Um, uh, you know, it, it was an interesting proposal. I think it mirrors some other proposals that we've gotten. Um, there was some reflection in the application about. Uh, vacant commercial space that they were hoping to fill and some of this they even referenced that some of the space had been empty prior to the casino opening. Um, and, you know, there are thoughts about uh, in their application trying to bring, you know, neighboring residents into their city uh, to, you know, enjoy local businesses in West Springfield. Um, for me, just made me a little cautious about are we, are we trying to take business away from one community uh, to another. Uh, but again, I get, I, I, I want to go back to this point of, and, and we've seen it now in the last three applications that we've looked at, uh, and others that, you know, there are a number of hosts and surrounding communities that are trying to maximize the presence of the casino. They're trying to capture the patrons coming to and from and through their community, as well as be a benefit to our licensees to offer additional activities and things for, for patrons and guests at, at our licensees to go out and do during their stay. And uh, I'd, I'd, I'd be more in favor of more of a regional approach with our licensees at the table to try to think through a bigger strategy and a bigger planning grant uh, application than um, what we're seeing in these kind of individual communities that are still not strongly connecting the dot with our licensees so commissioner stebbins is that something that would be addressed in the guidelines through the guidelines is that what you're imagining uh it could be and you know the frameworks as we put them together you know for next year obviously those are those are built with a lot of input from the local community mitigation advisory committee folks and our staff so it it, it certainly could be and I, I do think we, we want to look at that this fall with the, uh, with the advisory committees to saying, you know, look, if we, if we create these categories that make it exceptionally difficult to obtain the funds, why do we have those categories? Or maybe we can say under certain categories that if you're a surrounding, you know, if you're a community that touches the host community or, or host community that you're presumptively impacted and if you're looking to do sort of positive things like, you know, to Im increase, you know, uh, economic development in your community and try to leverage the increase in visitorship or so on, that, you know, we can establish those guidelines. But 
the way the guidelines are written today, we just have a really hard time making these affirmative connections to an impact. Yeah, I think I think that's a that's a great uh, point, uh, Joe. I think uh, maybe the categories can be singled out for proactively to say we really would favor a regional approach and yeah. clearly non-transportation planning would be one of them. Uh, I'll remind everybody that we, um, we have the incentive when, they, uh, when two communities work, work together, uh, they, could, they could get an additional 50,000 or whatever the, the case mm -hmm. may be to what, we, what caps we, we place to incentivize, which I think has worked in the past in a few times really well. Yes. Uh, we could go further, as you suggest, uh, Chair, and try to say either for this category or this type of requests, so grant requests, tourism promotion, or whatever the case may be, that we really uh, need to have some uh, or would welcome uh, the regional approach. Because we, we are seeing a lot of some of these same themes. Uh, yes. you, you, you read through the, the memo, there's another video for Everett and the like. Yes. Um, you know, and, and we funded a video uh, in Saugus before, and, 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 and that's a topic that keeps coming up in, uh, in the review uh, com uh, committee uh, discussions. It's like, well, it, it sounds like a great idea, but it would be a lot more worthwhile if it was more regional. And that, that actually, that could actually be part of, if, if I guess if you're we're doing any kind of outreach, encouraging them to start thinking about that now as we you know would be looking at our guidelines down the road but if have we ever i guess you if you don't have it in the guidelines a regional a regional application wouldn't conform with our our criteria or do we need to have that those guidelines established first no we right. we do allow we do allow multiple communities to yeah to apply Good. and we give them actually a bonus for doing so so yeah, that's what i thought still so yeah. then that's i think i'm hearing that theme too and uh, commissioner stebbins articulated it so well it just seems as though that, there, that it would be a more successful application if it's and more efficient and impactful so commissioner cameron and o'brien do you want to chime in on this I no hear i think it's a good idea we've we've done it before i know there have been comments about um even in yeah. workforce development areas where people join groups, join forces, yes. a bigger impact. So I don't think there's anything bars it at the moment, but it is a good idea to be maybe more proactive in messaging it as we move further away from the initial impact. Yeah. So, and, and we have publicly said we appreciate that, and it makes a lot of sense to work regionally and not duplicate the efforts in every town. Um, my other question was. Do we have any idea when that first um, look back study will be completed? No, you know, I, I know um, I had had some meetings with MGM back at the beginning of the year and it was in process. And then, of course, when everything went sideways in March, um, everything kind of got put on hold. I know that. So they have a couple of consultants. There's one consultant who does the economic piece of it and then there's a traffic consultant who does traffic measurements and I think they may have actually taken the traffic counts but they haven't compiled the it, you know so it's still I think most of the data has probably been collected but it just hasn't been all pulled together so I, I'll follow up with uh, with with Seth over at MGM and, and see what the status is because ultimately they are the ones who who do the study with the input from the communities you know all the communities agreed that they would compile, you know, their police statistics and their business statistics and all of those things that that they need to do this study. So it's a, it's definitely a partnership, and and you know, we asked a, a number of the communities uh, in our meetings with them, you know, what's the status, and they're like, oh, we got put on hold, and this, you know, for various reasons. So you know, that will certainly need to be resurrected, and it would be great to have that information to see mm -hmm. what are the impacts that we're really dealing with. Agreed. Can I can I mention one more thing about regional efforts? Um, and yes. I, I'm really I'm really not trying to argue both sides now, but <laughs> the counter argument to the regional uh, questions that we often ask 
is uh, in, uh, is more clear in, in my mind this year around uh, you know the the, the the grant request from Everett, in which they argue maybe this can be a pilot type of program that then is scalable and can be replicated in other communities. This is their data. Um, right, I like grant request. Yeah. Uh, again, we'll, we'll get to that. But the point is that it's not it's not very straightforward. Uh, I think there's good reasons to think that well maybe funding this one year can then be replicated later on even if it's not a regional uh, effort but one that could be replicated regionally yeah i, I agree with that. that that was kind of my point on the other consultancy that you know maybe that could be a replicate if it could be replicated as opposed to that wouldn't be a regionalized um, effort either but i think commissioner stebbins I, if i'm correct you were really thinking about the tourism the cross promotion of um, promoting the the uh, expansion of business opportunities in each in each uh, community and and the challenge that individually the applicants are having on particularly that area I know that the, it, co it comes under non transportation uh, um, category I just wonder if it almost begs that there should be an additional category where the regionalization would be really promoted. I, I, I like that idea. I certainly think it's something worth exploring. Again, you know, we, you know, the basic premise or the basic thrust is we have communities, again, that are trying to help capture some of the business from patrons coming from or trying to promote their, you know, their community and some of the assets in that community as a destination. Yeah, uh, destination. Connecting it to the casino is, is seems to have been a, a, a hurdle. Uh, and again, I think, you know, moving forward and looking towards work that Joe and Mary are going to do lining this up uh, for their work in the fall is to get some of those partners together and maybe rethink one of these grant applications. So to your point, everybody can be successful with, uh, with the application they put in. Okay. So uh, we, we had anticipated, oh, I'm sorry, Joe, your plan? So yeah, so we are, um, that is the end of the non-transportation planning grants. And I guess I will leave it to the commission to decide whether we want to tackle the transportation planning grants now or wait till next Thursday. I know there's some other things that are still on the agenda and I don't know how we're doing for time. Well, um, I appreciate that because, of course, we are behind substantially today, given just our, our um, initial IT challenge. So we do have our report um, from uh, Dr. Volberg and uh, Director Vander Linden, which we look forward to in item number six. And then, of course, we have our budgetary initial discussion with our um, Chief Financial Accounting Officer, Lennon. So, Karen, um, maybe perhaps joe now you can take down oh no let's wait to see if we're not going to go to transportation karen do you think that we should pause now and perhaps expand next thursday's uh timeline uh, yeah that's what i'm thinking given the hour and i, I do think uh, and, and we could always see how how long the other items take and then come back to this if, if joe and mary don't mind being on hold i could text them if, if we want to jump back on I, you know i defer to joe and mary um if, if they, that would work as well. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm available all day. I got the whole day booked for this anyway. Um, so that's fine. You know, the only caveat that I would put on if we defer this to next Thursday is that, you know, we, we're adding a whole new category for next Thursday. And, you know, that could potentially cause some of this to jump to July 1st. You know, if we don't get through it next Thursday, you know. But Next Thursday is dedicated to this, correct? Yes, I think we have one other agenda item. I think we got maybe is it Mark up front for a half hour or so, and then it's this. We can discuss next Thursday at the agenda setting meeting on Wednesday to make sure we don't have any other cleanup work as well. But I'm hearing you, Joe. We really do want, as Gail said, we want to try to focus next week on strictly communicate uh, community mitigation. So if um, you know. I know we really want to make sure to get next weekend for various reasons on Mark and Elaine's presentation as well. So 
and look, I think we can get it all in next week, but it just may be a bit of a marathon session, that's all. Well, maybe two breaks. Right. <laughs> two 20 minute breaks, Enrique. <laughs> All right, so let's pause um, for this excellent presentations and thank you for um, allowing us our, the opportunity, Joe and Mary, Jill, to ask our questions. And some of these questions are kind of preliminary questions on the overall process and not on the individual application. So maybe it will even go more streamlined next, next week. But if you don't mind being on hold, that would be great. No, no, and I'll stand by if you do want to uh, take this back up later today which I somehow have a feeling probably isn't going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. I'll stand how by, and if, if, if you want to do that, I am, I am certainly available to do that. Well, I'm just looking at my um, Mary Ann's timeline, and I know we're, we're quite off. And again, we typically aren't, and it was just, a, a, as I said, an unprecedented challenge, and I'm assuming that we won't have it repeated. So... Okay, then we'll move on to item 6A. Uh, Director Vanden, uh, Vander Linden, do you wanna start? I'm just looking to see if I can see you. Thank you, Jill and Mary and Jill. Thank you, Jill. Um, and we invite you to stay on if you want, but thank you. Okay, there you are, um, Mark. And then I know that um, we have Dr. Goldberg joining. Would you like to set this up, Mark? Yeah, I would be glad to set it up. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. Um, Dr. Goldberg, I, I see, has joined the meeting as well. Um, so today, um, we're going to be talking uh, about um, gambling involvement and its relationship to problem gambling. In 2013 and 2014, um, the uh, Gaming Commission um, began working with um, the U UMass Amherst um, in order to establish a baseline. Primarily the purpose of that uh, baseline study was to establish uh, gambling rates and specifically problem gambling. So to do that, the, the SIGMA team, Social and Economic Impacts of Gaming in Massachusetts, led by Dr. Bolver, um, did two studies, a general population baseline study of roughly 10,000 people and a baseline online panel of, of roughly, I believe, five individuals. Um, what I love about the current study is that it takes this, these two data sets that were, were uh, fielded for a very specific reason and it dives much, much deeper and it satisfies another piece of, of the overall research agenda as, as required by statute, which is to, to take a, a deeper look at, at the causes of problem gambling. And this is one such way in which we can possibly do that. So this takes a look at gambling formats. In other words, what are the, what are the forms of gambling um, that uh, have a tendency to cause more problems than others? It also takes a, a look at gambling involvement, meaning how many different types of formats people are involved in and what is that relationship to problem gambling? And then finally, intensity, um, which is the amount of time and money spent on gambling. And probably most importantly, and Dr. Bolberg will dive, uh, dive much deeper into this, is what is the relationship between these, these three issues um, as, it, as, it tees up, uh, uh, as it tees up problem gambling for specific individuals. So I, I'm, uh, I'm thrilled that Dr. Bolberg is here to present this. I'd like to point out that um, this is one of, this is a, a, a paper that was published in a peer-reviewed journal um, BMC Public Health, and uh, I, I, Rachel, was that in the current edition of BMC Public Health, or, or at least a recent, a recent? Yeah, it, it was, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so it was published earlier this year in an online format, um, and we, uh, we, we were actually provided some uh, resources by the Department of Biostatistics and Epidemiology to ensure that it would be open access so that anyone who clicks on the link that I have in the final slide can download the full article um, or they can get it from our website. Okay, so um, so I, I will now, I guess I can go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Volberg, but um, I hope you find this as useful as I do. I think it has broad implications, not only for regulators, but also we really need to 
um, look at what is the utility of this um, specific research as we consider prevention and treatment initiatives. So, uh, Rachel, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, am, I am not sure how this is going to work because I don't have much experience with, share, with screen sharing. Um, so, let's see what I'm able to do. Um, Sure. So Rachel, you, you see that um, down in the bottom center is the share button and, and you can launch your presentation from there. I don't think you'll be able to use the presenter view. Though. Mark, has, has Rachel um, emailed it to you? Do you have it? Because you could share it as well. Oh, there. Right, here it is. Okay. There so, we go. Excellent. Well, let's see how this works because I'm going to do the slideshow. Um, and now I'm going to see if I can do presenter view but you can all see the presenter view. So that's not going to work. Um, oh, that's good. All right, so I'm not gonna be able to see my notes, but hey, I- Mark, do you wanna share it for so um, she can see her own notes? Sure, let me try. That would be great, thank you, Mark. <laughs> okay. Apologize. I know this meeting is running long, but we'll. Uh... It's actually running on time. It just started late. <laughs> okay, great. Um, can everybody see the full slide there? I think you yes, might have. Yes, we, yes, we can. Uh, can? Okay. All right, Thank great. You. Good. And I can look at my notes. So that's fantastic. And I'll just. Um, I'll just uh, sort of guide Mark through it and let him know when I'd like him to advance the slides. So thank you very much, Mark, for helping this presentation. Um, so uh, if we go to the next slide, um, the uh, background for this study um, is, is quite broad. Uh, there's been a very long-term um, expansion in the availability of gambling and internationally, uh, but um, in Massachusetts in particular, there's been a very specific interest in addressing problem gambling as a public health issue. Um, I'm, I'm very proud to be able to say that Massachusetts was one of the first uh, U.S. jurisdictions to actually take a very specific a uh, public health approach to addressing uh, gambling harm and problem gambling. So one of the main concerns um, that gambling researchers and policymakers have had over the years is whether particular forms of gambling are more risky than others. And by more risky, I mean conducive to uh, leading to problem gambling behavior. So there is conflicting evidence uh, from the research field as to whether and how much the type of gambling format matters in relation to developing a gambling problem. And while some researchers argue that specific gambling formats are more harmful, others suggest that a more critical factor is actually involvement um, or the number of, in, of gambling formats or types of gambling that an individual is, is engaged with. And of course, this has implications not just for the development of services, but also for policymakers and um, regulators like yourselves um, who are trying to think about um, the safest way to make different types of gambling available to people. So moving to the next slide. Uh, different types of gambling, as I'm sure you realize, have different structural characteristics and are associated with different types of players and different types of player experiences. So just a couple of examples, traditional lotteries allow an individual to wager a very small amount for a chance to win a very large amount of money based entirely on chance. Uh, sports betting, as another example, contains elements of skill and the amounts that are wagered can vary widely. Uh, and electronic gambling machines, which is what researchers call slot machines, um, allow for continuous rapid play over potentially very long periods of time. 
So there's evidence both from population studies and from uh, studies of people in, uh, in clinical settings uh, that there are um, links between um, the types of gambling that people say they have engaged in and the likelihood of having a gambling problem. So there's studies in quite a few different European countries, in Canada, in Australia, and in the United States that have identified um, electronic gambling machines, casino table games, and online gambling as particularly problematic or risky forms of gambling. So if we move down, I'm just going to give you sort of, you know, some, some very uh, top level uh, definitions here. So Mark indicated that involvement um, refers to the number of gambling formats or types that an individual engages in with high involvement known to be associated with problem gambling. Um, there are some uh, studies that have suggested that the relationship between gambling types or involvement and um, or between specific types of gambling and problem gambling significantly decreases or is even erased when controlling for involvement. Um, but there are a number of limitations that underscore uh, that particular argument uh, because in fact, extensive involvement in several types of gambling is one major aspect of problem gambling itself. And so therefore it's not really appropriate to use gambling involvement as a predictor of problem gambling. This also explains why the number of gambling formats that a person engages in is a very strong predictor of problem gambling in statistical models, because you're using an aspect of the disorder itself in the model um, and other variables will, will not add much um, additional discriminative value. The next slide um, turns the topic a little bit. Um, this, uh, this sort of notion of intensity um, emerges from um, some uh, extensive discussions that I've had um, over quite a period of time uh, with international colleagues in Australia and um, in the Nordic countries. And what we have uh, sort of concluded that um, there's an aspect of gambling involvement uh, that needs to um, be addressed that has a great deal of overlap with um, involvement, but is not a complete overlap. So intensity, uh, we define, is the amount of time or money spent gambling. And it's, it's we, we understand, um, and there's good evidence, that the relationship between involvement and intensity um, can overlap, uh, but um, we uh, have come to uh, believe that if high involvement captures high intensity, then that latter construct, um, high intensity, may be a better, uh, more direct measure of problem gambling. So the next slide, um, I actually uh, authored, co-authored a paper with a couple of Swedish uh, colleagues uh, where we, we formulated this argument and we used data from a very large survey that was done in Sweden in 2008 to test uh, these four hypotheses that you see here. And um, the results were very, very interesting in Sweden. And it seemed to me that we had a great opportunity uh, here in Massachusetts with our baseline survey data uh, to actually replicate that analysis and see if the results were similar or different um, because each of those scenarios would be very informative both in Massachusetts and internationally. So the study that I'm presenting today, we sought to improve our understanding of the relationship between problem gambling, forms of gambling, gambling involvement, and gambling intensity, specifically in the Massachusetts context. And we tested these four specific hypotheses. Um, 
I won't read them to you here uh, in the interest of time uh, because we're going to be revisiting them a little bit later in my presentation um, as we uh, look at the results of the analyses. So the next slide uh, describes our methods. Uh, the analyses were based on data from the baseline general population survey and the baseline online panel survey. Both of the surveys were conducted in Massachusetts in 2013 and 2014. Uh, the eligible uh, population was Massachusetts adults aged 18 and over. Um, the, the two samples uh, were administered the exact same questionnaire. So we had two different samples of Massachusetts adults, uh, but they had answered all of the same questions. So we had the same information from all of them. For this particular analysis, uh, we only include people who had gambled regularly, that is once a month or more, on one or more of the eight major forms of gambling that we asked about in the surveys. We used uh, the, the PPGM to determine problem gambling status. And we uh, looked at gambling involvement as the number of gambling formats in the past year. And gambling intensity, we used highest frequency of participation as a proxy for time spent because we hadn't actually asked individual questions about that in the surveys. Um, and then for money spent, uh, we used responses to questions about um, how much people had spent on each type of gambling in a typical month. So a little bit, uh, a little bit more information here um, is that, or, or one caveat, is that uh, the information about specific casino games uh, was not collected in the Massachusetts baseline survey. So we didn't ask them separately about table games versus um, slot machines. However, the majority of casino gamblers in our Massachusetts surveys gambled in Connecticut and Rhode Island, both of which offered full service casinos with thousands of EGMs and hundreds of table games, along with sports betting, horse race betting, bingo, and keno. And we know that in the US, um, EGMs or slot machines account for between 65 and 80 percent of casino revenues. So moving down to our first hypothesis. Our first, hi our first hypothesis, hypothesis was that problem gambling would be more closely related to some gambling formats in Massachusetts than others. And indeed, we found that the proportion of individuals experiencing gambling problems was substantially higher amongst those who engaged in some gambling formats. So hypothesis one was supported. In particular, regular participation in betting on casino games, bingo, and sports were especially associated with problem gambling in Massachusetts. And just to give you some, uh, some context, the study that was done in Sweden uh, found that regular participation in EGM gambling, casino table games, poker, and bingo were the formats in Sweden with the highest problem gambling rates. So what this, what this uh, graph shows you is that, uh, for example, amongst past year uh, casino, um, I'm sorry, monthly casino gamblers, um, the problem gambling rate was quite high at 26%, um, almost the same amongst uh, monthly bingo players, and then um, sports betting and private betting, again, had quite high um, problem gambling prevalence rates amongst monthly players. So moving down to hypothesis two. Rachel, can I ask a question? Yes, of course, Enrique. Uh, just uh, go back a little bit to the prior page. Mm -hmm. I just want to conceptually make sure I understand, uh, and I understand uh, why uh, we we have only the casino aggregated in uh, in the one bar because of the timing that we made the, the, the survey. Mm -hmm. But if I take a, a parallel to the lottery, um, all these other forms of gambling at the beginning lottery, jackpots, instant scratch, 
daily daily is the daily games of the lottery yes that's the keynote game right just help me understand conceptually why in the aggregate all lottery is lower than any one of the other ones by, by themselves right so um all lottery is um is is uh an aggregate of the large jackpot instant scratch and daily games yes but, it, but it's important to understand that because lottery play is um is is differential across those games so the large jackpot uh lottery games are by far the most popular followed by the instant scratch um the daily kino games um, participation in, in daily Kino games um, is quite a bit lower than it is for other lottery products, uh, but the prevalence of problem gambling amongst that small proportion, even of lottery players, is quite high. Mm. I'm so having trouble he, with that too, Enrique. I'm having trouble. It's, with it's a weighted <laughs> average of sorts. It's, it's a proportionality, I suppose. Yes. That, um, because the populations are different, but but if but if doesn't this doesn't this um make this far this graph hard to digest? Because isn't it underrepresenting the impact of lottery overall? I, mean, I guess because you're separating it out when we think. Yeah, I, guess, I, I think the, the the way to sort of look at this is to um, understand that. Um, there is some overlap uh, amongst the problem gamblers that are in these different groups because as I'll, as I'll get to um, in, a, in a few minutes, um, these are not uh, mutually exclusive problem gambling prevalence rates. So the, the folks who are problem gamblers um, in casinos, um, a, a proportion of them are also in the problem gambling bars for all lottery and then all of them, of course, are in the in the problem gambling bar for any gambling because that's the largest group. It's got the largest denominator. Okay, that's helpful. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think um, I think you may have answered the next question, but let me let me um, let me put it this way. Imagine that we were trying to disaggregate the casino, mm -hmm. and uh, we were only concerned about two slots and tables. Okay. Yeah. And if there was a, and tell me if this is correct or, or uh, the type of reasoning, if there was an equal proportion of players in uh, slots and in tables, um, that we would see the similar, the same amount of problem gambling um, uh, rate or not necessarily? Well, if 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 the if the um, casino uh, denominator that is the the people who uh, played at casinos if they were made up equally of slot machine players and table game players yes it's not guaranteed that you would have the same uh, prevalence rate um, for for each of those because they're well yeah um, you're right Enrique. If, if, if it was equally divided, if it was 50-50, um, then the prevalence rate would be the same across the two types. But we, we know in the United States um, that uh, slot machines are far more popular uh, and generate more revenues than table games, which is opposite from uh, Macau, for example. Um, so, you know, I, I would... I would um, I would, I would not want to stake my reputation on those bars being exactly the same if we disaggregated for type of game. Yeah, and I was, I was just interested in trying to make a simpler example conceptually for us to visualize. Yes. If you only had, let's say, two games, slots and tables, mm -hmm. and we were comparing, uh, uh, you know, they were evenly distributed. Uh -huh. Would we be likely to see the same rate? But but uh, but understood. Let's let's move on. I think. Yeah. Very ahead. helpful, though. I'm glad you asked the question, Enrique. Thank you. Okay. Hopefully, I'll be able to shed a little more light on <laughs> some of these other hypotheses. Um, so let's move down to hypothesis two, Mark. 
So hypothesis two was that problem gambling would be positively related to high involvement of gambling. Um, and uh, indeed, we found that um, the uh, number of gambling formats, which is what, which is, what is displayed on the, um, on the, the x-axis. So uh, this shows problem gambling prevalence rates for people who only engaged in one format monthly, those who engaged in two formats, those who engaged in three formats, and for some reason, no matter how many times I tried to copy this, uh, this graph, um, the, the plus sign kept dropping off the four. So this is four plus um, gambling formats monthly um, on the, on the, on the right-hand side. We did a number of additional analyses, which I won't go into. Um, they have statistical names like Spearman's correlation and ROC analysis. Um, but we uh, did determine that, and as this figure shows, the proportion of regular gamblers experiencing a problem increases linearly as the number of monthly gambling formats increase. So, as a, as, a, as a statistician noted, this is a beautiful, <laughs> a beautiful line. Um, so that means that, or what this uh, shows is that our second hypothesis was in fact supported uh, in the Massachusetts data. Moving down to hypothesis, oh, I'm sorry, moving down to the next slide. I want to just note that the hypothesis was supported, but with an important caveat. What this figure shows is that the overall percentage of individuals not experiencing or experiencing a gambling problem across the number of formats. So you can see um, here on the left, um, the, uh, the estimated proportion of non-problem gamblers and the estimated proportion of problem gamblers amongst individuals who engaged in one gambling format. And similarly, across two gambling formats, across three gambling formats, and here I was able to get my plus sign in. <laughs> so I have four plus gambling formats. What this slide shows uh, is that among individuals not experiencing gambling problems, 45% gambled on only one format. But as the number of monthly gambling formats increases, the proportion decreases. So from 45 to 34% to 13% to 7.5%. Mm -hmm. It's not quite, but almost the opposite uh, story for people with gambling problems. Uh, it increases from about 16% among those who only engage in one format. Um, it jumps a little bit to 28% amongst those who gamble in two forms uh, on a monthly basis. Uh, but it, it, if you smooth it out, it, it's a, a, a linear increase rather than a linear decrease. So you can see amongst individuals who gamble on four or more types of gambling on a monthly basis, uh, about a third of them um, are actually experiencing gambling problems. And why am I, ah, here we go. And Rachel, remind us what was the, um, the cadence of um, involvement for, for you to make it into any one of these categories for months, once a so, month? Once a month or more often, yes. Okay, um, so, so yeah, there is that important caveat that um, there is a, a, a small but substantial proportion of people who experiencing gambling problems who actually are only engaging on a regular basis with one gambling format. So that sort of unpacks or loosens uh, the relationship uh, that many people have, have posited uh, between heavy involvement and problem gambling to an extent. 
So moving down to hypothesis three. Uh, so hypothesis three uh, was that involvement in gambling would be positively related to intensity of gambling. So that's the idea that a better way to assess, um, uh, you know, sort of heavy investment in, in gambling uh, might be through assessing the amount of time and money a person spends gambling rather than uh, limiting it just to the number of gambling formats. And uh, so we did um, a, a statistical tests uh, using um, gambling in intensity measured in money and frequency, um, which would be, you know, number of days uh, in the past year um, that a person, or in the past month, excuse me, that a person has gambled. Um, the relationship was not as strong as it was uh, in Sweden. Um, we think there's a number of reasons for that. Um, so while not as strong um, as the results in Sweden, the results from Massachusetts do suggest that there is um, a positive relationship between involvement and intensity. Um, I think that uh, if we had been able to disaggregate uh, the casino gambling uh, into table games and, and EGMs, uh, we might have found a stronger relationship um, because that was where uh, the strength sort of uh, of the positive relationship in Sweden kind of emerged. I'm sorry, somebody seems to have a car alarm going off in my neighborhood. <laughs> uh, okay. We don't, we don't hear it, Rachel. Oh, so. Thank God for that because they seem, oh, great. I'm sorry, they're having a protest in my neighborhood. <laughs> that, that, we, we welcome um, the exercise of, of some. <laughs> so. On my street <laughs> with honking horns. <laughs> Are you sure you can't hear that? You can continue. I think we can all hear you just fine. And, and I understand it's a distraction for you. It's fine. I'm sorry, that was terrible. Um, no, I support, their, I support their right to protest, but I wish their timing had been better. Okay. Um, finally, uh, this slide. Oh, I'm sorry, Mark, if you could move down. So this is the thing of beauty that uh, we ultimately created for Massachusetts. Uh, this is our last hypothesis, which was that gambling format would mediate the relationship between involvement and problem gambling. And indeed, that is what we found. So I'm going to explain this graph to you a little bit because the first time people look at it, their heads just explode. Um, it's very colorful, but it doesn't immediately make sense. What this illustrates is the proportion of individuals experiencing gambling problems among those who regularly gamble on a specific format across groups of increasing involvement. <laughs> So um, this first, uh, the, the green line is casino gambling, and you can see that it stands out a good bit from the other uh, gambling formats. Um, what, this, what this dot um, here, the first point on the casino line represents is the problem gambling prevalence rate among those who only gambled on casino games. So that's only people who had gambled, who gambled on a monthly basis on casinos. The second point on that line, um, which is over the two, uh, the second point represents the prevalence of problem gambling among those who gambled regularly on casino games and one other gambling format. And then the next, uh, um, a uh, dot here above three is the prevalence among uh, uh, monthly, <laughs> monthly casino. Excuse me, one moment. I feel redemption from yesterday. It's not mojo or chipping. No, we, we're Nothing. Good. For, for a moment. Just for a moment. 
Um, well, Rachel, I had to do the same thing yesterday, so. Really? Um, thank what you. What's in my neighborhood is making my dog just absolutely cuckoo crazy. Um, okay, so. Um, third dot. Third dot, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the third dot is the prevalence rate among people who gambled monthly on three types of gambling. And the fourth dot is the prevalence rate among people who gamble on four or more types of gambling. So you can see that the, the casino, the prevalence rate amongst monthly casino gamblers, regardless of um, how many other formats, um, is um, substantially higher until you get to four or more. Um, it's interesting to see also that uh, regular bingo participation had the highest proportion of problem gamblers among those who participated regularly in four or more types of gambling. Um, and except for those who participated in casino and sports betting, prevalence of problem gambling for all other gambling formats was below average among those participating regularly in three formats. So overall, um, this was a, um, basically this exercise controlled for gambling format and involvement uh, simultaneously. And that was, <laughs> that was, um, that was the unique aspect of the Swedish study, and that was why I felt um, it was worth uh, replicating or trying to um, do the same analysis in Massachusetts. So moving down to- uh, could we, Before we move on, are there any questions on that particular slide? I think uh, you did just briefly cut out, um, Dr. Volberg, the, the bingo line. Did you address that? I couldn't- I'm not sure if yeah, um, the, the thing I wanted to draw attention to on the bingo line was that it does have the highest uh, prevalence of problem gambling amongst monthly bingo players who do three or more other types of gambling. So, you know, the, the, the sort of the policy relevant piece here is if you're a regular bingo player, and you gamble on three other formats, three other types of gambling. Say you go to casinos, you play the lottery, and you you know bet privately as well as playing bingo. Um, your odds of having a gambling problem are quite high. Interesting. Thank you. Other questions on that? Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I do. I do have a oh. question. Um, Sorry. I I, I was going to ask it earlier or later but might as well um is there uh, something about the life cycle of a game rachel if i look back at the arc of uh let's say bingo versus casino gambling mm -hmm. one is much newer the other one has been with us for a lot longer as a society right and so is is it is, is it possible that there's an effect of whoever remains in any particular game is likely to be more uh, a problem gambler uh, just by virtue of longevity of the game? Or that, longevity of the player. Um, you know, right. the, the, uh, the, uh, that's, it, that's sort of a confounding issue is that um, you know, bingo, like horse racing, uh, trends, trends um, quite a bit older uh, yep. in terms of the demographics of their players. Um, and you'll notice that we don't have horse racing on this graph. And the reason for that is because of the very small number of people that engaged in horse racing on a, a monthly or more frequent basis. Um, similarly, uh, for online in our Massachusetts data, uh, we don't have um, we don't have enough uh, uh, people in those cells to be able to look at those data with confidence. Right, but I know that there's a disproportionately so slightly higher from other studies that you've made you've done in those in those groups um, slightly yeah. higher risk. Yeah, when you aggregate yeah. not just problem gambling, but when you put in at risk uh, gamblers. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's true. And I've argued in um, a, a couple of other contexts that there are these older, um, more well-established or longer established forms of gambling, uh, certainly in the United States, horse racing and bingo, um, that have been around for many, many years uh, that people, um, you know, very much associate with um, a, a social network or with, you know, they have their gambling friends, um, you know, the, the horsemen or the, the regular uh, gamblers on, on horse racing. Um, you know, there's a whole culture associated with that similarly uh, with bingo. Um, so that's another piece of the puzzle there. Right. Yeah, no, I know. I mean, I think that's happening. That's beginning to happen to the slot player, both aging and, you know, a life cycle, I think, mm -hmm. uh, throughout, throughout the country where, um, you know, younger people are, are engaging in a different form, format, uh, unlike their perhaps older parents. Yeah, <laughs> I remember. I remember the um, uh, I did uh, adult and adolescent surveys in Nevada about 20 years ago, and you know we hypothesized that um, both the adults and the uh, and the the adolescents in Nevada would have much higher gambling rates and much higher rates of problem gambling, and yeah. it worked out okay with the adults, but the adolescents had very substantially lower. Um, participation rates and lower problem rates than uh, any of the other jurisdictions where I had done adolescent surveys. And in sort of talking to young people about the results over a period of time, um, it's pretty clear that, you know, kids don't want to do the type of gambling that their parents are doing. It's very uncool. Are there any other questions about this uh, this beautiful graph? Thank you, Rachel. Okay, let's move down to the conclusions. Okay, so um, this uh, study uh, was consistent, as I mentioned, with other research showing that casino gambling um, uh, in the case of Sweden, it was especially uh, EGMs, but also table games. And we, we can't unpack that for Massachusetts, uh, but we can say that casino gambling in general may be an especially problematic gambling format. And with the introduction of casinos in Massachusetts, we are looking forward to the possibility of examining whether and how relationships that we've identified here may have changed. Um, we are quite excited about um, the follow-up general population survey that will be fielded, um, not immediately, but in, uh, in uh, uh, the fall of um, 2021, we hope, uh, when we um, would strongly recommend that a follow-up online panel survey uh, be added at a relatively low cost um, in order to be able to replicate this particular analysis, but with the um, added benefit of being able to disaggregate EGMs and table games. Um, another uh, another um, direction that we are interested in pursuing perhaps in the future um, is using these data uh, to explore relationships when controlling for age or race or gender or socioeconomic status. And then I believe this is almost, well, this is my next to last slide is the next one, Mark. So um, this study, I believe, underscores the importance of focusing both policy and regulation as well as problem gambling services and particularly prevention in Massachusetts on casino gambling. I think there is a suggestion in these data that pending sports betting legislation may need better safeguards and funding for problem gambling prevention and research. And I think um, my concluding point is that uh, while we know that the online environment is riskier, 
Uh, we also know that it's more amenable to technological interventions. And I've written a number of occasions about um, using the online environment um, and designing basically uh, gambling uh, preve uh, problem prevention seat belts and airbags um, as online gambling is made available to people. So one last slide, <laughs> because this was an academic study, we of course have to acknowledge that there are some limitations. Uh, these are cross-sectional data, which limits our ability to make causal inferences. Uh, for that, we need longitudinal uh, cohort data. The data does not distinguish between physical and online participation in specific formats. Um, and different forms of access may mediate these relationships that we've identified. And then finally, despite the uh, large data sets that we had, some of the groups were quite small and associated with large confidence intervals around the estimates. That's the main reason why we didn't include um, horse racing and online gambling in our analyses. And then last but not least, Mark, my last slide, um, tells everybody where to go to get the article and how to cite it. Excellent, uh, Dr. Volberg. Questions, uh, commissioners, uh, because of just our formatting, or perhaps, um, uh, Mark, you can take down the um, PowerPoint now. We can. Well, I can actually, I, I actually. Oh, did you want to go question. back? <laughs> yeah, I had a question uh, on, on the My apologies. page of the conclusions. It's, yeah. yeah. So sorry. Um, I, I'm so sorry. I, 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 I was just about to catch myself. No, no, that, that that's quite okay. If uh, if Mark, if you can go back to the yeah. second page of the conclusions, uh, right there. Um, yeah. You know, I'll I'll I'll, I'll plug. I, I wish um, we'll we'll get this presentation to our friends at DPH because that's um, there's many implications in terms of policy that concerns yes. them as well. Um, I will just um, first make a comment and then ask you, uh, Rachel. Um, so you are very familiar with the game sense program that that we that we have by statute at, at the casinos, where we hope to have uh, the most intervention intervention in real time on, on casino players, which you seem to suggest, at least in, you know indirectly, uh, in in your conclusion here in the first one. Um, I, I'm wondering if you follow that logic to what also happens at the casinos with the game sense program in terms of eventually uh, being able to sign up people to the voluntary self-exclusion list mm -hmm. does that mean that when you if you take away one or let's say one of the more risky behaviors in this case casino gambling um, does your risk go down in other words from your graph where you had the, the sliding up graph where you went from one to two to three and four plus, all uh -huh. of them trending upward. Is it possible to, once you take one, to come right back? Uh, I, I'm not thinking of, of any one individual, but does that thinking translate? So I think I think what you're asking, Enrique, is at the population level, if you remove a form of gambling from the mix, does that move all of, um, does that move all of the uh, prevalence rates across the multiple involvement down? I wasn't, I, I wasn't thinking about the population level. Um, okay. I'm not suggesting, let's say, that you know now we shouldn't have casinos. Uh, that's that's not going to happen. Right. I'm thinking, if you are up, you know, in this pop, soft population of gamblers that engage in multiple ways, where 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 the number as the number of your engagement goes up, your risk goes up. And again, mm -hmm. maybe that's the the answer to the question. I'm, I'm I'm thinking more individually, and you're thinking more population. Right. But, but is it possible that, you know, a group of people that make it into the voluntary self-exclusion 
after having engaged in the casino, one of the most risky, as you show here, um, now you remove that one, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, form of gambling. Does this is tends to reason that then the risk for that group goes down? In other words, is it is it intuitively your graph made it the more you gamble, the more your risk goes up. In other words, from from left to right, is it possible to ride the curve backwards? So at the individual level, um, we know that um, gambling is um, problem. Gambling can be episodic, and so um, you know people people use uh, voluntary self-exclusion or they, um, they change their own gambling habits, you know, maybe without um, any other kind of interference. Um, usually when they uh, sort of, you know, become uh, concerned about uh, their own um, involvement and intensity of gambling. So we know that there's a lot of um, sort of in and out, um, but, as you'll recall, uh, one of the limitations of this study is that it is cross-sectional. Um, I think it would be very, very interesting uh, for someone to uh, take a look at um, the relationship in the magic co in the cohort data uh, between changes in gambling participation or you know number of gambling formats, or to use this approach even. Um, to try to understand um, how people's gambling changes um, from wave to wave of, of the cohort study. I think that would be um, an, an even, a, a, a better way to um, answer the question that you're asking, which is if somebody stops one form of gambling, but they're still doing three other forms of gambling, you know, what happens to their problem gambling status? Yeah, I, you know, I'm reminded of early, early on in my tenure as, as a commissioner, I came to see a, you know, a, a recovering gam gambler, uh, you know, speak to one of those testimonials that the Mass Council mm. puts together that are so powerful. Mm. And, and somebody asked her a question that is very relevant to this, this study. I, I think um, they, they, they asked her, uh, you know, is there any particular form of gambling that you think did it for you because she was doing a number of them right and and she she made the great analogy i thought at the time that i still that i think still holds which is that you know i, I was also this is what she said i was also an alcoholic and mm -hmm. my preference was scotch but but i could have any kind of drink at any given point right you know that that would do it and so is there a substitution effect here um, that that you know you, you you're observing as you say and it's cross-sectional but but you know if you're a problem gambler or an alcoholic you you'll take whatever well i i would um uh respectfully disagree with you uh if we go back to um slide number 10 mark if you want to share that slide um Basically, what that slide shows is that um, there's a very substantial proportion of problem gamblers in Massachusetts who are only gambling on one or two formats. So this is going to be up to hypothesis two. Yeah, this one. You can see that 16% plus 28% of the problem gamblers were only gambling on one or two formats. And most of the um, people who were in, wait, let's see. Um, yeah, no, that, that, this doesn't tell us about specific gambling, types of gambling that they're doing, but this tells you that um, a, a very substantial proportion, so 30 plus 15, is about 45%, a little less than, of problem gamblers in Massachusetts that we surveyed um, were only doing one or two types of gambling. So it, it's not just the, the, uh, the, the sort of 
um, breadth of gambling involvement, this very clearly shows that there's something about specific formats of gambling um, that are associated with problems. In other words, is it fair to say, if you're thinking, if you take the VSE and you, and you take out ga casino play, you're suggesting, Enrique, that they're gonna find an, another source of, of, of gambling, but they may, but bingo may not be their thing, just because bingo's the only other alternative available. Well, there's, there's a lot of lottery games. Um, there are a lot of lottery games, right. So yeah. lottery is lottery's more intuitive than bingo, fair enough. So. Um, and, and that's what I think, Rachel. You're saying that that's not necessarily the case. If they that it, they won't get the satisfaction of gambling from just another form of gambling, where so alcohol right. is not necessarily a great analogy. Yeah, I mean, gambling and alcohol are analogous in lots of ways, but this is one of the ways that they're not analogous. Interesting. Um, there, there are very specific groups of people that are attracted to specific types of gambling, whether they're gendered, whether they're age related, whether they're class related. Um, they, it, it, it's very well um, documented across many jurisdictions. And so um, someone, who, you know, someone who has a strong preference for sports betting, for example, you know, they may do lottery playing, but that's not, you know, that's just like something that they, you know, sort of do on an impulse occasionally, but their real thing is that they, they think they're really good at betting on sports and that's what they're enthusiastic about and that's what they're intensely involved with. Perhaps you saw the article, I think it was in the Globe, maybe this week, where the um, young, younger uh, demographic had shifted because sports betting wasn't really available, that now they were doing the, um, the uh, sort of micro um, investment uh, yeah. in the day, stock market. Day trading and, and penny, they, Yeah, the day penny. trading and, and, and the micros. So yeah. they weren't going to the lottery convenience store and buying lottery tickets. They were now shifting to a, a different uh, challenge. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I think, you know, that's sort of where the alcohol gambling analogy falls apart a little bit. Interesting. Um, not all gamblers are going to be equally attracted to specific types of gambling. Thank you. Uh, no, I think, uh, you know, again, some of the um, insights from these type of studies, I think, let us leave us to um, programs like the Game Sense program, where if we engage in conversations with with people and we know that they're regulars when it comes to slot play, but we also know, for example, that um, they play the lottery regularly. We have a one in three chances, I guess, um, if I'm reading this graph correctly, right? 27% uh, mm -hmm. of being, of, of that person being a problem gambler, gambler just by knowing those two, those two data points. Is that, is that a fair statement? I'm sorry, I, I, I wasn't I wasn't quite able to follow. So you're, okay, you're so talking about the twenty the twenty eight percent of people who engage who are problem gamblers who engage in two formats. Right. Right. Oh, maybe that's the key. Mm -hmm. Who are problem gamblers? Let's take let's take our, our ourselves to the Game Sense program, where right. we get a lot of casino visitors, and we engage with them regularly. Right. And let's say I am a game sense advisor and I'm interacting with somebody who I happen to know. They come regularly. They come, you know, at least once a month, which is part of your study here. I don't mm -hmm. know if they're problem gamblers or not, but they come here uh, regularly. I also then know that they're regular lottery players. Right. So then you know that they are gambling on two formats. On two. And if I yeah. know that that second format, they're also engaging in monthly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Am I now, can I transport ourselves to this graph and say, this is a person who one out of three, 28%, I may be, without asking them any more questions about their gambling participation or expenses, I may, I may be engaging with somebody, you know, one out of three people who may be a problem gambler. Well, Is that I would, the right I would, way to... Yeah, I would, I would make it one out of four because I would round down to 25%. Okay. Um, 
but but yeah, that is that is um, a, a good takeaway from that for a game sense advisor um, or a game sense program. Okay. And and similarly, if the game sense advisors um, are finding out about all of the other forms of gambling that people that they're talking to do on a monthly basis, if they if they identify that they're doing four but three other types of gambling on a monthly basis in addition to the casino, that's then, a one it's a, three, then it's a one in three. That's a 34%. Yeah. One in three. Rachel, um, I hadn't thought about this, but are there combinations of gambling that would indicate greater risk? Is there a, a deeper analysis of this that you could say that casino gambling combined with um, daily lottery or sports betting is actually um, it's actually the combination that has the greatest risk. You know, we, we thought about that as an analysis, Mark, um, but uh, again, we ran into sample size problems. Uh, when you start, you know, when you start carving, um, you know, this, um, this two and three and four plus groups into, um, you know, uh, casino and horse racing or casino and bingo or you know each of those specific ones has to be uh disaggregated and mm -hmm. we very quickly ran into a cell size problem so um it's a really intriguing idea um you know i can talk to the team about maybe trying to figure out um some some way to do it uh, but it, it would be it would be challenging just for statistical um, you know confidence in your statistical results. Rachel, this is Bruce, and just Hi, to Bruce. kind of pick up on Mark's point, um, and I know you're talking about in the conclusions around sports betting, but you give sports betting uh, a high degree of prevalence up under uh, hypothesis number one, and that among everything across the scale is the illegal part um is that tend to show a riskier behavior and that somebody who's willing to you know do that kind of betting transaction illegally is probably a uh, a riskier or more problem gambler that's a that's a, a really good question bruce but i'm not sure that i'm not sure that these data really speak to that um I think because because sports betting emerged well, yeah, in in Sweden um, it was it was online poker. Where to go? Sweden. In Sweden it was it was um, EGMs, casino table games, bingo, and online poker, and. Um, the data that we collected in Sweden um, was actually collected uh, right in the midst of the poker fat, you know, like craze. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, Sweden did not have um, online poker uh, available to its citizens through its gambling monopoly. So these were all offshore um, sites that were marketing to Swedes. Um, so, you know, we speculated at the time that um, there might be something similar to sports betting in the United States where, you know, there's sort of this change that's going on. It's rather uneven jurisdiction by jurisdiction. So, you know, sports betting is legal in New Jersey, but it's not legal in Massachusetts. But people living in Massachusetts are like, well, you know, if it's legal in New Jersey and you know, why can't I do it or what's so wrong about it? And I'll just go, you know, find a way around, um, you know, the, the federal laws. Um, so, you know, there was a similar sense in Sweden of um, online poker was incredibly popular. It was all over TV all the time. Um, and there were a lot of uh, young men in particular in Sweden who got very, very, um, deeply involved in online poker playing, but it was all with these offshore um, operators who weren't regulated. And we think that was one of the reasons why um, that particular form of gambling um, was so closely associated with problems in Sweden. 
So I think there might be something similar going on with sports betting in Massachusetts, but I can't say for sure. Okay, thank you. Other questions for Dr. Bulfer? I can, I, I'll add, I, I thought this was an excellent uh, report and presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and uh, important work for us to kind of pause and think about really what is the core to our mission. So uh, thank you. The timing was just right. Uh, unfortunately, in terms of today's schedule, not, but in terms of our overall agenda, really important. Other Great. commissioners? No, thank you very much, uh, Rachel, as usual, uh, very insightful. Thank you. Well, thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, I was I was really um, so proud of the work that, that um, my colleagues and I did in Sweden. And when I told them that I was going to try and replicate it in Massachusetts, they were very, very excited. And when I finally sent them the link to the article, we had a great back and forth about you know, the differences between Massachusetts and Sweden. But I, I feel like that's something that I really um, just really enjoyed bringing to um, Massachusetts and, and to the Gaming Commission in particular is lessons that I've learned, you know, over 35 years of gambling research, but more specifically, you know, doing work with international colleagues and bringing it back to Massachusetts and trying to see, you know, how it sort of um, manifests here is, is really, really a, a, an honor and a privilege. Well, thank you. Thank you. And, and we experienced whatever, if it were either a celebration or a protest, we experienced it with them. Uh, but it was not, but it was not disruptive at all. It was very clear presentation. Thank you, Dr. Wolver. Thank Great. you, Mark. Are you, Mark, are you all set? Yes, I'm all set. Thank you very much. Um, actually, if I could just say one thing, uh, this tees up um, an agenda item that we'll we have next week where we begin talking about how the data um, I, I, I several know. years has incredible value in, in a whole host of ways. Thank you, and we're looking forward to that. Yeah. Yeah, he I'll froze up, but he's talking about the data uh, access project. Right, for next week. Yeah, you just broke, but we, we, we were aware of what you're up to, so thank you. All right, Great. then uh, thank you so much, and we'll move on uh, to another really important discussion from on item number seven on our agenda. Chief Financial and Accounting Officer Derek Lennon and team. Derek, I'll let you introduce. Um, and... Kathy, could we get a five-minute break? Sure. While everybody uh, that, gets settled. That time makes sense. A little stretch because this is really important for us to be hydrated. And and um, I I had to I had some sunlight challenges, so maybe I'll regroup on that too. Great, thank you. We'll do five minutes. Uh, it is now two fifty-four. We'll return at three. I think the goal will be. Um, I think Derek reserved about a half an hour or so for today's discussion. So we should be looking at some kind of a conclusion around 3.30 or so, not in any way to hurry that discussion, but that was the original goal. Five minutes, we'll return. Thank you. Do we have all five of us? Uh, Commissioner Cameron? I'm here, thanks. Hi, Commissioner yeah. Bryan. Commissioner Zuniga, Commissioner Stebbins, Commissioner O'Brien. Great, I see Derek and team. We'll reconvene meeting <clears throat> number 308. Continuation of a, a good long day. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Good afternoon. Uh, before I start on the presentation, I'd just like to take a quick second to uh, thank and recognize what an excellent job the IT team is doing in implementing the transition to the cloud. Um, you know, and we all talk about it in our groups. It's easy to focus on the things that are an inconvenience right now. Um, but I think it's just as important to recognize the amount of mission critical items that are working seamlessly and in the background that we don't take notice of and may take for granted. Um, to Katrina and her team, thank you. This is no easy task you're undertaking and doing it in a completely remote environment makes it that much more difficult. Um, 
So now on to the uh, item on the agenda, the FY21 budget recommendations, which I know you've all anxiously been waiting to get to. I know it's <laughs> taken a while to get here, but we are all ready for this. Um, and it's a good way to end the day. Um, I'm joined by Doug O'Donnell and Agnes Bollier, and we're here to present to you um, staff's recommendations for the FY21 budget. I'll just try to, if I pause a little bit, I'll be trying to move the memo as we work, uh, work along on it. Um, we're recommending a collective $39.7 million budget for the Gaming Control Fund, the Racing Oversight and Development Fund, the Community Mitigation Fund, and the Public Health Trust Fund. It funds 93 FTEs, um, six contract positions, and I just want to point out that the budget we're presenting does not include estimates for the racing capital and promotional trust funds, nor does it include funding for the grants from the community mitigation fund. Um, the $39.7 million uh, is composed of the following, uh, 32.25, well, let me get up there a little bit, 32.25 for the regulatory and statutory required costs of the Gaming Control Fund, $2.68 million for the Racing Oversight and Development Fund, $170,000 in funding for the from the Community Mitigation Fund, which I'd like to point out this is the first time we're recommending any spending of administrative funds from the Community Mitigation Fund, and $4.62 million from the Public Health Trust Fund for the MDC's Office of Research and Responsible Gaming. Um, the Gaming Control Fund is composed of two areas, the MGC's regulatory costs, which are directly within the control of the Commission, and the statutory assessed costs of the Expanded Gaming Act, which we do not have control of. Both costs are the responsibility of our licensees to pay. Page three of the memorandum breaks out the regulatory costs, uh, which are $26.7 million, and the statutory costs are $5.5 million. Uh, and include funding for the Attorney General's Office, the Alcohol, Beverage, and Control Commission, and the Commonwealth Assessment for Indirect Costs. The Game and Control Budget um, overall is a 4.5% decrease from FY20 currently approved funding levels. Um, and on the regulatory side, it's a 5.28% decrease from our current um, funding levels. Page five of the memorandum illustrates major funding variances. And the following is a list of major changes. Now, one thing before I get to the list of major changes on page five, while we are down 5.28% from our currently approved level, um, we are down closer to 10% from what our maintenance um, funding level was. So we started this process back in January before COVID-19 hit. Um, and you know, people are looking at what, what it would cost to maintain current levels of service. Um, as we go through this, you'll see just from where we are right now in FY20, we're down quite a bit um, in, in some categories. So under um, payroll, we are down 9.8% or approximately 957,000 in salary and fringe funding. Um, we're from the 20 levels, this is a 10% decrease in our FTE count. Uh, it's achieved by not backfilling vacant positions. Um, you'll see in the memo it's two gaming agents, an enforcement council, a licensed reciprocation verification coordinator, or an open source specialist, the ombudsman, a staff attorney, a help desk position, and a chief administrative officer. We're building in some anticipated turnover savings and associated fringe benefits. And there's also no funding for raises built into the FY21 budget. Um, I also want to point out that, you know, where, where we stand right now, um, if you look at where we started off FY20, we're at about $8.2 million um, proposed for, um, for salaries. Right now, we're at $6.6 .6 million for FY21 we're proposing. That's close to a 19.5% cut from where we started um, last year. So I know... Um, you know, the numbers show our currently approved levels throughout the year, we have used turnover savings and attrition to fill in some of the um, costs we've experienced so that we didn't have to increase our assessment on licensees. Um, 
For the first time, we've shifted 1.25 FTEs of funding and associated fringe and indirect costs of community mitigation fund. That also helped to reduce the AA. Um, we've reduced our travel and training budgets by approximately 66%. Um, we've reduced the legal costs um, to the minimum required by our insurance policy. We do see a slight increase in public safety costs, um, and there's also a slight increase in IT spending for our shift to the cloud. The racing division budget for FY21 is decreasing by 2.67%. This is mainly a result of the administrative positions we're not backfilling that would um, have been charged off a piece to that division. Finally, the Research and Responsible Gaming Office of the, MBC, of the uh, MGC will be funded from the Public Health Trust Fund for the second time in FY21. Let me get down to that. And funding for this office has been re reduced by 26.5%. That number is correct, 26.5% from the approved FY20 budget of 6.29 million. The FY21 proposal is down to 4.62 million, with most of those reductions coming from the GameSense program and research contracts. However, funding for the research manager, a position that was approved in FY20, which we cut, um, is also cut from this budget and represents a 33% reduction to our staff in that area. Um, so that, that's, there's a lot of information in the backup documents, but we did hold um, two by twos to update on some of the details. So I, you know, I know we're, we're moving um, rather slow on this meeting. Um, so I will move on to the, um, the assessment piece, which is another uh, main issue and is, is um, not clear this year. Um, MGL Chapter 23K, Section 56, as well as 205 CMR 121, require the MGC to make the following annual fees and assessments on Category 1 and 2 gaming licensees. A $600 fee for each slot machine approved to be used at a gaming facility as of July 1. And an annual assessment, that's the difference between the projected spending for the Gaming Control Fund and the projected revenues. And finally, not less than $5 million to be deposited in the Public Health Trust Fund. Um, due to the uncertainty of the timing of reopening of licensees, um, needing a revised uh, approved slot count for July 1, and not knowing the number of gaming positions um, that each facility will open up with, we're unable to provide the normal chart that we'd have that would show how much each licensee would be paying of that uh, for that $600 per machine fee, as well as what their proportion of the remaining assessment would be. What we can tell you is licensing is projecting about 750,000 in revenues. And if you use um, uh, 23K section 56, basically the licensees are responsible for the difference between revenues we're projecting to bring in outside of them and our spending. So that would leave $31.5 million for the licensees to pay in that slot fee assessment, as yeah, well as their Yes. Can I just interrupt? Because I'm not sure if I'm seeing on the screen that if you're following. I don't oh, know if sorry. other people. Thank you. Yep. That just would be helpful. My yes. apologies. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for correct. <laughs> thank you for correcting me. I'm reading from my notes and not following along in the memo. Thank you. It just will help us follow. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so that leaves 31.5 million dollars. Um, that the licensees will pick up of our budget, whether it be through slot fees or through the assessment process. Um, the big piece I wanna point out is the $5 million that's required under um, 23K as, what it, as well as 801 CMR 21, the um, Public Health Executive Committee met and is trying to provide some um, um, timing Re, um, relief on this. So they're looking to basically delay the first quarterly assessment of the $5 million until either the very end of FY21 or the very beginning of FY22. Um, so they have said that, you know, out of the 5 million, they'll try and pull in 3.75 between July 1 and June 30 um, to provide a little bit of relief. Um, so if you combine all of those together, um, you know, the 
licensees are responsible responsible for a 36.5 or if you go for this revised amount and then roll the other 1.25 into the beginning of next year 35.25 million in assessments timing of payments was a big issue um, so you know i want to i want to take a step back really quickly to say the whole process we went through um, was was very difficult this year, given all the uncertainties, but it was also helpful. Um, I think staff came to the table um, understanding the, the circumstances that the licensees were, were um, experiencing. I think licensees came to the table with an understanding that, um, you know, while they may be experiencing very difficult times, we still have a job to regulate. Um, so they had some very good recommendations during our meeting with them on May 26th. Um, some very good ideas of how we could um, reduce our, our spending levels, and they had a few um, requests. Um, they asked us to consider for the first time breaking the annual slots fees into smaller tranches, um, either quarterly or monthly. We usually do that on an annual basis right up front. And then they asked us to continue billing um, the assessment on a monthly basis, which we've been doing for the last quarter of um, FY20. So, you know, I, I put that in our conclusion that, um, you know, we're asking the commission to contemplate that. Um, if you were asking for um, an opinion on that, I think that we would prefer to see quarterly payments of the slot fee um, so that we do get some money up front. We're not worried about bouncing payroll and as well as getting two months up front of the assessment and then going to a monthly billing structure and re continuing to review that throughout the year. Um, we do have some agencies that rely on ISAs from us, the Attorney General's Office, so we need to provide some funding to them too. Um, so by doing this, I think it balances the request of the licensees, uh, as well as being responsible to ourselves and our partners that rely on these funds. Um, let me see. So I'd just like to say thank you to the staff, um, division and bureau heads, licensees, commissioners, and especially the finance and HR teams, Jacqueline Connett for coordinating and generating loads of information, and especially Karen and Commissioner Zuniga for being there every step of the way in developing this very difficult budget, um, especially meeting with uh, licensees as well as internally with staff and helping me to explain it um, to, to people when I couldn't um, do it in a, in a plain terms way. Um, at this point, if the commission has any questions, we can field them now, or if there are no questions or comments, um, and everyone just wants to be done with this meeting, we would like to put this document out for public comment and return back to the next public meeting for vote and or adjustments. Before we begin, I do. I also personally want to thank Derek and team, and and Commissioner Zuniga and Commissioner um, and 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 uh, Interim Executive Director Wells because they were very patient with me early on as I as I sort of slogged my way through the process. So thank you um, for your patience. Uh, this has been a, a a process that has been very complicated by all the circumstances that uh, the entire Commonwealth is facing. I have um, one one um, issue that I'd like to address. Uh, I don't know if my fellow commissioners have any others, but uh, I'll start. You know, one of the the largest items of our expenditures is uh, with respect to our our EU unit, um, and of course overtime. I know that we have monitored that in the past. I've been fortunate enough to sit down with Captain Connors, and he's gone through his process. And I know that Commissioner Cameron has done that very very carefully. I am wondering if I could ask Commissioner Cameron and Commissioner O'Brien to maybe um, do that kind of review to support Captain Connors over the course of you know, the next year because it is such a significant part of um, our work and the budget and just so that we can have some kind of a regular reporting. Um, it will give Captain Connors, I think, an additional um, reporting, you know, so that he has somebody to speak to if there are any challenges. Um, Madam Chair, uh, that is not a problem at all. Happy to assist. And uh, as you mentioned, we've been doing this for uh, a number of years. 
with with Captain Connors, looking at those numbers, uh, looking at ways to frankly have savings, um, and 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 deciding where our public safety costs should really be um, and are effective. So you know, I'm happy to continue to do that, and um, I would like to thank. Um, the team, the finance team as well. These could not have been easy discussions with licensees and other stakeholders. Um, so I, I think this year in particular was so challenging and um, this is a really good work product. So thank you. Thank you. Commissioner O'Brien, um, I'm sure that you and, and Commissioner Cameron can coordinate, but I just think that that would be really helpful process. So thank you. That's fine. I'm happy to continue helping on that. And I get I was briefed in one of the two by twos by Derek and the team. And thank you to everybody involved. I know they worked really hard on dealing with something in a really tough time. So I appreciate the work. Thank you. Commissioner Stebbins, I think maybe you were gonna speak. Yeah, I um thank you, Madam Chair. Just to to jump in and uh, to thank Derek and the team. I know Derek and over the years, as we were growing staff, as we were opening casinos and hoping to get to a steady state where we might be able to balance out some of our costs and uh, appreciate the great work Derek has done to finally uh, start achieving, I'm sure, what are some of his goals with respect to our budget. Uh, as we talked about in the two by twos, I personally have a concern about using some of the community mitigation funds for some administrative costs. Um, I think we can have a discussion about that next week when we when we vote on the budget, but um, I would suggest perhaps having a separate vote on that because that's kind of a policy change for us um, going forward before uh, we have a vote on the full budget. It might warrant a little bit more discussion, um, uh, Derek, uh, exactly what that policy issue is because you are sending the budget out for a, you know, for comment, and we want to be fully transparent about that. So perhaps the timing is if you could just elaborate briefly on that. I think it was a one hundred what seventy thousand uh, dollar shift. So thanks. Correct. Um, we're shifting off one hundred seventy thousand, and it's a it's approximately one point two five FTEs, and it is the staff. Um, it's part of Joe Delaney and part of Mary Thurlow's salaries. They work on that program on a daily basis, not just on giving out the grants, but as well as administering it, um, tracking expenditures, getting the reports in from the grantees. Um, and, you know, the statute does require us to administer the funds. Um, we have sent over to, um, to the comptroller's office as well as a &F to get that appropriation set up for payroll to be charged to it. That is, um, that has been approved. But Commissioner Stebbins is correct. It is a policy discussion, which is why we're putting it up as a recommendation. Um, you know, most grant programs do pay for the administration of the funds. Um, you know, we had talked about doing this in the third quarter um, when we made a lot of reductions and we decided to come back and give it a better attention during the um, fiscal year budget process. So I think it's completely appropriate to have a, have a deeper conversation. Um, you know, it is 170,000, we can move it back to the gaming control fund and then that um, just gets absorbed by the licensees as part of that assessment and um, slot fee payment. Um, but it, I think there is some merit to charging off the costs associated with administering that program um, to the program, especially now that it has a steady stream of income coming into it. While it may be reduced, um, completely understand, but it is a steady stream of income coming from the gross gaming revenues. And just, just for my be, colleagues. Oh. One second, Commissioner Stebbins, please. Yeah, let me just, and, and, and Derek brings up a good point. I certainly appreciate uh, what we're up against and kind of thinking outside the box. So uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily uh, saying that I, I don't agree with this recommendation. I think there's some things we need to consider. Certainly flow of money into the community mitigation fund for next year. This might not be the best year to do it, uh, as well as making sure that we're uh, sympathetic to the fact that, you know, there's allocations of the money that stay in Region B and there are allocations of the money that stay in Region A. 
and being fair that if we do this, there's fair distribution of that funds from, from both of those accounts. Yeah, I, I think it would be done uh, proportionately by taking, uh, you know, uh, taking of the fund. I, I, as, as it's been alluded, and again, it's, it's good to talk about it, and we'll talk about it in the next meeting as well, but it's in keeping with our practice in other areas. It, this is something that we propose to do, and um, our prior executive director didn't want to pull the trigger last year, uh, but there's parallels to the Public Health Trust Fund uh, raising uh, in charging people who spend uh, most of the time doing work that comes from a revenue source that is not licensees. So it's, I know it's not easy. It's not, uh, you know, I don't think it's, uh, it significantly um, short changes the, the fund, uh, but I know that, you know, it's a, it's a difficult year all around. Um, I, I wanna touch base on a couple of things, if I may. Yes. Um, what, um, I will just chime in quickly again something that we might not have to decide uh, today but um, one of the things that Derek mentioned as a, as a bit of an open question um, I think uh, I would when it comes to the quarterly assessment um, in this year I would be in favor of making the quarter assessment to have a working capital if you will um, for the first quarter and then move back to month to month just like we did at the end of this fiscal year, move back to month to month after the first quarter um, as they, um, you know, as they have asked. The reason being is that we have a number of obligations and ISAs like, like Derek mentioned, and it's important to have, you know, the ability to make those commitments with, with cash on hand. Um, but again, that is, that is subject to, to discussion and we can, we can decide on that separately. Um, and the other thing, maybe I don't want to confuse more, uh, I think Derek uh, outlined it well, but the slot fee in my mind uh, has been, uh, not in my mind, the slot fee has been a topic of discussion with licensees and where were I, one in which I think there are at times a little bit of confusion, meaning that if by July 1 that there's no slots operating, which may or may not be the case, uh, that they might then not have to pay that fee. And to me, that's where the um, misunderstanding might be. Uh, if that's the case, then the balance, which is the rest of the approved budget, would still have to be assessed on licensees in proportion to the prior, the previously approved gaming positions. So to me, there's not a uh, a difference, it's a bit of a difference without a distinction, uh, unless the thinking is that we will not assess that fee and eat the difference because we're not doing the balance. And that's not what, what I suggest we, we should do. If, if that were the case, then we would need to find additional savings somewhere in the budget. If I could just, if I could just ask Karen on that matter, if you could follow up with Todd. Um, and see if there's additional guidance from a legal perspective on that. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. And, and a key point to that, which Commissioner Zuniga and I have talked about, is, is actually the ability to assess on a prorated basis the $600 for how, how long the um, slot machine will be in use. And in the past, we've there have been no machines in use, and we've um, assessed that fee on what was actually approved. So if we wanted to go back to what's currently approved, um, but not operating, that would be a much higher number. Um, so, you know, there, there are a lot of issues to discuss with Todd about this, um, yes. but more than happy to have those discussions and hopefully we'll have some sort of um, initial numbers before we come back um, for the meeting in July. Can you remind me what, which, what the date is? Is it July 2nd that we're planning on? Or is it later in the month? Derek? I don't know when that next meeting is. Okay. Um, Karen, do you have that next meeting? Well, the, the schedule has the, you know, because the 25th is an extra meeting, so the regularly scheduled cadence would be on July 2nd. Yes. That would be the one, because we'd want to put this out for public comment and, and give it time to... Is that enough time for you for that, if the public comments go out now? It's July 2nd? Okay. Yes. 
I'll, can I make another point? Um, yes. Just, uh, just in terms of what the budget does not include, um, which I think is also important to at least consider, we're not assuming that there will be uh, furloughs or the need to do any kind of uh, really workout uh, scenario, let's say, with, with some of the, of the contracts that we have, uh, rent, for example, or the contract, the central monitoring system. Um, I, I don't think we're there yet, uh, uh, certainly not, not there. Um, but I did want to mention that uh, in this environment, the longer that the casinos remain closed, the, 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 the more likely that the, the, um, the, the event is in which one licensee might say, I have no indication that anybody's at this point, by the way, let me preface that. But the, the likelihood increases that somebody might say, I can simply, uh, I know I owe this assessment, but I may not be able to pay it for now or for the time being. And that's something that it's important for you to at least, for us to at least mention it, um, consider it as a possibility, not a large one, but one with implications in the budget discussion. And again, that, that has significant legal implications as well. Um, it's, you know, so again, um, you know, Enrique is, it's completely hypothetical um, based on, a, a, you know, some of the, um, projections you're making, but of course there's a, a whole statute, statutory scheme that we'd have um, to consider should that ever happen. Right now our, our, um, our licensees are, have, um, we're working very collaboratively and it's been very um, significant work done on the budget. And we thank you for that, Derek and, and team, Karen and, and Enrique, and, navigating this at, you know, remotely in difficult circumstances, so. Thank you, um, and, and as Enrique pointed out, you know, that, or as you pointed out, Madam Chair, that is a very low likelihood, um, what Enrique is pointing out, but he does bring up the what if scenario, and we yeah. have to walk through that. I do want to report that the licensees, all of them have paid the um, April, May, and June assessments so we have our full funding in the bank for fy20 yeah and by the way this is i'm perhaps bringing my risk assessment hat because we're going through that process as we speak um, and in that format you know for for our internal um, group in that format we have the low probability scenarios with huge implications this is one of them there's high probability scenarios with high implications and this is not one of them uh, but it's it's something that uh, that um, it's a decision that we would have to react quickly in the, the, the vegan confines, etc. But one that we at least all, all all my fellow commissioners need to at least um, consider. Thank you. Do we have any other questions or comments? Excellent job, Derek. This is our first step in the process. And be very interested to see what public comments um, we receive. Thank, I know the entire team. I see Agnes there. I know Jacqueline and Doug, um, Sarah, your entire team. Thank you so much. It's all part of the effort. I'm leaving out soon. All right. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I think that that is our last item on today's agenda. Uh, we will not, I'm making an executive decision, fellow commissioners, return to uh, community mitigation. Uh, I see a thumbs up, at least one, <laughs> at least one. I think that, uh, I think that that topic deserves our really, you know, focused attention and it's been a long day. So uh, to give, um, that our, our um, proper uh, consideration will, will hold. I don't have Madam, any, oh, sorry. We, I was Madam Chair, I, um, I see Mr. Corey wanting to speak and it's entirely at your discretion to, uh, to give that opportunity to anybody. Uh, I, I didn't see Mr. Corey um, asking to speak. 
Mr. Corey, just so that you understand, um, when we have public meetings, tip, we don't typically um, have the public uh, um, make presentations unless it's part of our agenda. However, you have been here the entire day, and it would be really unfair um, for us to to disregard uh, your your increase. So, uh, for for the at least to create a precedent of your your um, uh, willing to hold us out, we we will allow you for a brief comment. Thank, Thank you. you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to uh, request that now that you've um, accepted the application of uh, Plain Ridge Park as timely and uh, sufficient, I would like to hold over uh, the request of the Harness Horsemen with regards to the renewal of their license for the time in which you will be actively considering uh, the renewal, our presentation on our request with regards to that matter. Certainly, and you did submit the letter and uh, that's in our records. We, as you heard today, um, next Wednesday, we will be looking at our uh, schedule for the deliberations on the uh, relicensure. So um, you'll be aware of, of um, our schedules and I'll make sure that uh, Dr. Lightbound is in coordination with you. So um, again, my apologies if you had intended to speak on that, but again- I, I uh, did not. Oh, it's, it's, it, it is a challenge. It's, I must say, on these kinds of items, the virtual is a challenge. To, otherwise, the virtual is pretty easy, but it is hard to see people raising their hands, so my apologies. This has been very informative, uh, so I've enjoyed it. Well, thank uh, and, you for sticking with us. And the, and the, uh, the work that has been done recently between uh, Chris McElwain and uh, HHANE has been extremely encouraging. With, with the uh, work uh, with Commissioner Cameron and Dr. Lightbaum as well. So uh, we're, we're so appreciative of that uh, to, as well. Thank you so much. Well, we, we like that. And, and I did feel that Tuesday's session was a very positive session. Yes. And um, I'm hoping that every voice felt heard. So thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mr. Corey. Bye-bye. All right. Um, uh, our next item is actually, if we have any commissioners update, is the update, any updates? Okay, <laughs> I'm seeing all no's. With that, um, I wanna just thank the entire team, everyone for their patience. We just had a little late start, but it was a really um, you know, great business operations uh, meeting. We got a lot done and um, appreciate everyone's effort. Uh, you know, people who are still on, all of you, have contributed today and every day. So thank you. Appreciate it very much and stay safe. With that, do I have a motion? Motion to adjourn. Thank Second. you. <laughs> Commissioner Cameron, you couldn't jump in there fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not even gonna ask for further comments. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner uh, Zuniga. I thank you everybody and especially to the finance team and, and, and Mark and everyone for a great job. And Commissioner Stevens. Uh, thank you also to the team and uh, happy Father's Day for all the fathers out there and I vote aye. And I vote yes and again, thank you everyone. Be safe. <laughs>